In the depths of a dungeon, an adventurer wandered around grinding to gain the experience he needs. But unfortunately for him, he walked straight into a boss battle and he didn't quick save before he got here, so he is screwed. Against a monster like that with the whole introduction animation, he stands zero chance with his subpar equipment and weak skill level. So he just stands there and awaits death with his only regret being that he never got the chance to become a mithril ranked adventurer. That day, the adventurer died, but some time later, his body, or what is left of it, begins to move again. He doesn't understand why he is still alive because he is certain that he definitely got cooked by the boss, but to his horror, he looks in a puddle and discovers he has become even skinnier than he was before. Up on the surface, adventurers usually start their day early, but that's not because they want to, it is because they are poor. The only people who get to sleep until noon are rich people or researchers with a coffee addiction and a sleeping disorder. Though he may be biased because he knows a researcher who would tell him that she sometimes gets so hyper fixated on her research that she forgets to sleep. He should probably go check on her at some point to make sure she doesn't end up killing herself. With that said, neither of those conditions apply to our MC Rento, who is currently struggling to pay the rent as a bronze adventurer. He has to wake up early because the quests that are available to be taken care of first come, first serve type of deal, so you've got to be there on time if you don't want to get stuck with the terrible ones. But if you don't end up finding any quests that are suitable for you, then you're going to have to go into the labyrinth to make ends meet. And on this day, that is exactly what happened to Rent, so he decided to go into the labyrinth of Moon's Reflection. Most adventurers work in teams, but Rent often works solo. He says there are a number of reasons for this, but the main one is that he sucks at being an adventurer. In fact, is still in bronze rank after having been an adventurer for over 10 years now. As long as he can hunt and sell materials to the guild, he will be able to survive on the money they pay him. So surprisingly, Rent's life is actually pretty stable, especially considering he saved up enough money in case of emergencies, so he's already better than most regular people. He headed into the labyrinth, but on this day, the calm, analytical mind that has allowed him to survive as an adventurer went on vacation because he found something that should have been impossible. As he walked through the labyrinth, which had had every inch of it explored, there was a hole in the wall just sitting there. This wasn't recorded on the map, so Rent believed it must be a new passageway that was created by the labyrinth. This was a major discovery, and also when his brain went on vacation, so against better judgment, he entered the clearly dangerous hidden room. The further in he goes, the more convinced he is that must be an unexplored area, and the only thing going through his mind is the thought of what amazing treasures may be lying here, waiting to be discovered, not realizing that there would probably be something guarding that treasure, and but even if there isn't anything he can get, just delivering this information to the guild would be enough to get him a lot of money. So he continues to explore the dungeon without a care in the world. Normally, he would have avoided a place like this, but being blinded by all the rewards he could earn, he ventured into this dangerous place without any backup or method of scouting out danger. And his recklessness only got him into trouble as he came face to face with a dragon. And not just any dragon either, this angel-looking monstrosity was a true dragon. The legends say they are able to take on many forms, and it often differs from what would be considered normal for a dragon. But as it slowly approached Rent, even though he had never actually seen one in person before, he was sure that this must be a dragon. Its presence alone was enough to freeze Ren in place out of fear, but even if he was able to move against a being that stands at the apex of monsters, as a bronze adventurer, Ren stood absolutely no chance. Yet here is still somewhat alive despite being eaten by a dragon, but that only means he must have come out the other side. He is glad to still be alive, but this doesn't really count as being alive. He is now a skeleton, an undead monster. He thinks about going back to town to figure things out, but then he realizes that the second he steps out of the labyrinth, is going to be captured and purified until there is nothing left, so he decides not to go there for now. He tries to keep calm and think about this rationally so he doesn't end up making any huge mistakes, but first he grabs his sword and gets up. He doesn't feel the presence of that dragon anywhere nearby, but it is better to be safe than sorry, so he leaves the area and heads back into the labyrinth. He continues to wander around looking for an adventurer to talk to, but they are all probably going to a more popular dungeon now. If he waits a few days, he may be able to find a solo adventurer coming from through and ask him for help. But if he wants to do that, he's going to need to be able to talk first, and he doesn't have a mouth anymore. From around the corner, Rhett notices a skeleton just standing there, but once it finally sees him, it still chooses to attack despite Rent being a skeleton as well. Rent readies his sword to swing on the skeleton, but as he charges towards it, he realizes that his transformation into a skeleton has come with one major debuff. All of his gym gains are gone. With his bony structure, he is now unable to even swing his sword without falling over because he is so weak. But fortunately, 
The same goes for the skeleton that is attacking him as it falls over on itself and loses a leg. While it tries to reattach itself, Rent just laughs and thinks of a strategy to defeat it. While he's no skin and all bones like this, you won't be able to use the swordsmanship skills that require you to have actual muscle, but his decision-making brain comes back from vacation and he remembers that he can use his special ability. Spirit. He manages to activate the ability just as the other skeleton reattach its leg and they are set to fight again. But this time, while they are still both skeletons, Rent has something to give him an edge. His spirit ability which enhances his bones and allows him to actually use his sword to fight like he normally would. So as the skeleton runs up to him, he cracks it over the head with the sword and sidesteps before smashing it all together. A skeleton has been defeated and Rent gives a sigh of relief that he managed to survive, but the body of the dead skeleton began to glow to his surprise and green energy flowed into him from it. Rhett notices that the energy he has expended in that fight had been replenished in an instant, so he wonders if this might be a mysterious attribute that monsters have. He remembers his researcher friends talking about how monsters are able to become more powerful with age and experience, but is on a different level from what is possible for a human to do. A skeleton would always be a skeleton, but in some rare cases, it will be able to evolve into a ghoul. That is because of existential evolution, something that she was currently researching at the time. Brent thinks he can use this to his advantage since ghouls have flesh and almost look exactly like a human, so if he were able to transform into one, he might also be able to get back into the city if he disguises himself with a robe and a mask or something. So he now has his new goal of slaying monsters in this dungeon and becoming a ghoul. Back with his researcher friend, she is feeling a little lonely since Rent isn't showing up to her house like he usually does, but she accepts that he won't be coming today, so she goes to get dinner ready. In the labyrinth, Rent has successfully killed five skeletons so far and is steadily gaining experience and agility as he levels up. It also seems like the light that he absorbs has some kind of recovery effect so he is able to keep using his spirit indefinitely. With how well things are going for him, Rent decides it may be time to try challenging one of the stronger monsters in the labyrinth. He walks through the halls until he comes face to face with a slime, and though they are resistant to physical attacks, they can easily be defeated with magic. But unfortunately, Ren is not talented enough to have offensive magic at his disposal. At best, he can only use basic spells for everyday activities, so he is forced to use physical attacks to defeat it. There are two methods to accomplish this, one he can either break through the slime's core that is constantly moving around in its body, or he can destroy the gelatinous body to the point that it is beyond regeneration, but he isn't strong enough to do that normally and is going to have to go all out just to not get himself dissolved by the slime. The slime launches three acid balls at Rent in an attempt to dissolve him, but he dodges and goes in for a strike, and luckily, he managed to hit the slime's core and defeat it. Back on the surface, a guild receptionist gets asked if she can help a new adventurer find a good party to team up with. The girl is inexperienced, but she is good with handling a sword, so she isn't completely unneeded. Unfortunately, there weren't any parties that were a good fit for her, so the receptionist was planning to ask Rent to take care of her in the meantime, but he hasn't returned to the town since the previous day, which is out of character for him. Back in the labyrinth, Rent is taking a break, but he realizes that he doesn't get sleepy anymore and he has no appetite since he has no stomach. Since he can basically run on a broke college student's routine, he tries fighting through the entire night, but even that wasn't enough to get him his evolution. Still, it's not all bad since when he first woke up as a skeleton, his physical abilities were much worse than they were as a human. But now that he has slain a ton of monsters, he is basically back to how he was before and has all the abilities he had from before he died. He is even able to use divinity despite being an undead. That wasn't expected, but it works out well for him as he uses it to keep the bread he brought good for a few more days in case he ever needs to eat. After that, he gets back to his objective of becoming a ghoul and decides he will keep his plan of killing monsters little by little and moving up in difficulty. Right now, he can handle one or two fairly easily, but three might be a little tough, and if he sees four at once, he's going to have to run, but it's not likely that the monsters will move around in such large packs. Even as an undead, Ren is still really weak. He spent 10 years as an adventurer and went nowhere with his career even though he is able to use spirit, mana, and divinity, which is rare for a person, he is not particularly strong in any of them, so he remained as weak as ever. Deep down, he knew he wasn't cut out to be an adventurer and most people would probably have quit after a few years of being stuck at the same bronze rank, but he never stopped trying to become a better adventurer. He trained every day and asked his friend to help him study monsters and magic. He even took on all manners of quests, no matter how small they may have been. He had a dream to become a mithril adventurer in his lifetime, a level at the top of the adventuring world, which not even the naturally gifted could easily reach. It is reserved for only the most powerful adventurers, 
capable of saving a kingdom on their own, and he isn't going to give up on that dream just because he has become a skeleton. He continues going through the dungeon and killing monsters, soon becoming even more powerful than he was as a human. And after killing one more slime, it finally happens. He feels something strange happening to his body as the energy flows into him and all his muscles grow back. He has become a ghoul. He is really excited even if his face isn't able to show the expression. He now has skin again, even if it is dried up and decaying, but if he keeps going at it, he may eventually turn into a vampire and by that point, he will look exactly like a human and can return to his normal life. But for now, having more than bones means he can talk again, although it is going to take some practice to learn to speak well again. Ever since he evolved into a ghoul, he had regained his muscle back and can now move better than he could while he was a skeleton. Now he can strengthen not only his body but also his sword and the difference is clear as he is now able to easily defeat two goblins in one go. Elsewhere in the dungeon, Rent finds a rookie fighting a skeleton and the girl just barely manages to beat it. Rent is excited to finally see another human after such a long few days, but he also realizes that he can't carelessly approach her since she would either try to kill him or just run away. He doesn't recognize her, so he assumes she must be new to this whole adventuring thing since he knows basically every adventurer in the town. Ren continues to follow the girl through the dark dungeon and realizes she is heading in the direction of that dragon cave that killed him. He has to find a way to stop her, but luckily, a skeleton spawns behind her and diverts her attention. She begins to attack and Ren can tell that she has received good training, but she is pretty weak since she needs to land several hits in a row in order to kill the skeleton. She gets herself backed into a corner and has the skeleton closing in on her. Ren can no longer sit still and watch her embarrass herself, so he steps up to save her before she gets deleted by the skeleton. As he approaches, the skeleton recognizes him as the bigger threat, so it turns around to face him. But Ren is screaming internally at the girl because she has a clear shot to backstab it right there, take the shot. Realizing she isn't going to be of any help, Ren takes matters into his own rotten flesh-covered hands and one-shots the skeleton. After that is taken care of, Rent tries to approach the girl, but she is understandably freaked out to have a ghoul approached so casually. To try to calm her down, Rent starts saying he doesn't intend to hurt her, while also dropping his sword. He tries to explain to the girl that he is the adventurer Rent, but then she asks why he looks like this now. He explains that he got killed by a dragon, but she just wants to confirm that he isn't going to try and eat her or anything. Rent swears that he has no intention of doing so, but he asks that she help him out with something if she's willing. He wants her to buy him some clothes because he would like to go back to the town, something like a robe so he can hide his body. He gives her his pouch of money and tells her she can keep the rest if she buys him the clothes that he is asking for. The girl now understands that Rent truly isn't trying to hurt her, so she introduces herself as Rena and swears that she will repay him for his help saving her from that skeleton. However, she still keeps her sword pointed towards him the entire time as she leaves. Rent doesn't really like how cautious she is being around him. But that is probably how an adventurer should act in a situation like this. Come to think of it, a proper adventurer would also probably just report a situation like this to the adventurer's guild rather than actually help him. But he doesn't think Rena would betray him. As Rena returns to town, she immediately goes back to the guild receptionist who had been worried sick about her since she didn't come back from the dungeon on time. Rena says she is fine, but a lot of stuff happened, so she would like to ask about some. Later on in the labyrinth, Rand is fighting a slime and can tell that he is much stronger than he was as a human. He is much more powerful and can use his body to its full potential now more than he ever could. Now, if only his face did look like a wrinkled nut sack. From the dungeon entrance, Rand hears Rena calling out to him and he is honestly surprised that she actually came back for him. As he approaches her, she notices him and immediately draws her sword out of fear because she isn't sure that he is the same ghoul she met earlier, but after Rand confirms that it is actually him, and he seems to have gotten himself past preschool levels of talking after a lot of practice so Rena can understand him better. Back on topic, she tells him that she has brought the clothes he asked for, as well as his change which she goes to set down beside the bag, but Rent gets a little too close so she starts backing away in fear again. But she apologizes and tells him that she is a little scared of him, but she will eventually get used to it so he shouldn't feel bad. Rent tells her it's fine and goes to look through the clothes that she brought for him, it is absolutely perfect. Rena even went the extra mile and bought him a pair of boots and gloves to hide the rest of his body. She's so considerate that it's enough to make a grown man cry but not Rent, because he still doesn't have tear ducts. Rent tries on the clothes and he looks cool as heck with that outfit. He loses some visibility, but that is the price you have to pay for looking so cool. Although there is still the problem of his met sack face, so he needs to do something about it before he can return to town. Rena had thought of this as well and bought a mask for Rent to hide his face, but as he tries it on, it gets sucked into his face and he can't seem to pull it off. 
This mask clearly has Curse of Binding on it, so Rina apologizes for bringing it to him. Now that she really thinks about it, she should have known better than to trust it back Ali's stall. It was also pretty suspicious that the mask was so cheap, but she was blinded by the Black Friday savings. She apologizes again, but she did check the item for a curse before bringing it here and didn't react, so it must be a curse that only activates when it is put on. If it is a curse, then maybe Ren can dispel it with the divinity he has. Rina is surprised that he can use divinity even as an undead monster, but the power he has wasn't enough for him to get rid of the curse. It doesn't look like he will be able to take off the mask anytime soon, but it doesn't really matter since he needed to hide his face anyway. Now that Rent looks less undead, Rena suggests that they can return to town together, so they both get on a carriage to ride to Malt. On the way there, Rena tells Rent that she registered to become an adventurer in the capital, but there were too many skilled adventurers there, so she was forced to leave due to the skill gap. She came out Malt because it was much more newbie-friendly than most towns. Plus, it had two labyrinths nearby, so that was an added bonus. Rent agrees that coming to Malt was a good decision for her to make, but he is surprised that she was willing to come all the way out to the countryside despite being a city kid. They get to the town gate, but Ren is hesitant to go through since almost everyone here knows him, so they'll be able to tell it something is wrong if he shows them his ID. If that's the case, then she suggests that they go to the west gate since that one normally isn't used as much. They get to the west gate and are asked to present their identification to enter. They do so and are allowed passage, but the guards take issue with Ren's cool but emo outfit and start hassling him to show his face. Rina comes up with a story on the spot and tells the guards that Rent was badly injured in the dungeon, so bought a mask to hide his scars. However, the mask turned out to be cursed, so he can't take it off now. Rent even offers to let them try to take the mask off if they don't believe him, so after confirming that it is cursed, they feel kind of bad for hassling an injured man and let him go through. Once inside the town, Rina is excited to go around and do things with Rent, but just like that, he went to get the milk and disappeared. From a nearby rooftop, Brent watches Rina, and he can tell that she's going to become a great adventurer, so when he looks a bit more human, he will come back and apologize to her. For now, he has to go find his friend so she can help him figure things out, so that night, Ren shows up to Lorraine's house and finds her sleeping on the couch. Even while sleepy, she can tell it is Rent from the way he acts, but there is definitely something wrong here. So she decided to play a little prank and act like she was sleeping, but after seeing what happened to him, it's a little too late to say it's just a prank, bro. Lorraine has studied monsters all her life, but she has never heard anything about someone getting eaten by a dragon and turned into an undead after they get shit out. Coming from anyone else, she wouldn't believe a single word that was just said, but since it is coming from Rent and he currently looks like one of the malnourished children that Nestle uses for labor, she is inclined to accept his statements as fact. Rent appreciates that Lorraine isn't freaking out over his new look and is just thinking about it calmly, but it does feel like she thinks of him slightly more as a test subject than a friend. After pondering for a bit, she turns to Ren and asks if he really is the same person. And that's a fair question, since even though he still has his memories and thinks the same, there is no guarantee that he is actually the same. For now though, he acts normal enough for Lorraine to trust him. So she asks what he intends to do from here on out. Ren tells her that he wants to keep being an adventurer, since while he may have died already, his dream of becoming a mithril adventurer lives on. However, he can't show up to the Adventurer's Guild looking like this, so to continue adventuring, he needs Lorraine to accept quests for him, plus, he would need somewhere to stay since he can't go back to his inn either, so Lorraine offers her home to him. In exchange, all she asks is that he helps her with his research. Rhett knows exactly what that means when he is dealing with Lorraine, so he makes it clear that she isn't allowed to dissect him or anything. She tells him that there is no need to worry since she never intended to do that in the first place, Though she may take a bit of his flesh for science. Later that day, Ren is doing some cleaning to help out when Lorraine comes back with some money in hand. He had asked her to help him sell the items he collected while he was in the dungeon, but she decided to just pay him for it directly, since this way she won't have to pay the guild's fees. Isn't tax evasion great? Ren thanks her for the help, and now that he has some money to use, he announces that he will be going to the blacksmith to get a new sword. Ren walks through the streets, happy to be able to move around freely again, but he is still subject to the judging stares of the people that find his look to be terrifying. He pulls his hood down and just keeps moving until he gets to the blacksmith, but the receptionist lady there is also frightened by him. He apologizes for looking so unsightly, and the lady realizes that she is being really rude, so she ignores how he looks and asks what he would like her to do for him. Rent tells her that he wants to have his sword repaired, so the lady takes a look at it and from the damage it has taken. She can tell that he knows how to handle a sword well. It looks like he can also use spirit too which Rent confirms, adding that he can use mana and divinity as well. 
The lady is surprised as it is really rare for anyone to be able to use all three. In fact, there's so only one other person whom she has ever seen who is able to use all three, which coincidentally is also Rent. He asks her not to make a big deal out of it since he would like to avoid too much attention. So the lady promises not to speak a word about it to anyone else. Rent pulls out the money Lorraine paid him and asks if this will be enough to have a new sword made for him. So the lady takes a look and says it should do the job, but is going to take some time for it to be finished since their blacksmith is very thorough in his work. Rent says he is fine with the wait time, so whenever the sword is ready, they should contact Lorraine to get a hold of him. Meanwhile, Lorraine is reading up on the information that is available about ghouls. They are lower class undead monsters and there have been cases reported where a powerful monster was able to turn people into undead. But in those cases, the people seem to have lost all personality and human emotion with their transformation. However, that clearly isn't the case with Rent right now. She knows that something about him must have changed, but he still feels like the same old Rent she knew. We get a flashback to when Lorraine was younger and Rent was just a newbie adventurer and as she took out a quest which required a bit of traveling, a man called out to her and asked that she takes Rent along with her so he can gain some experience as an adventurer. Thus, they went out into the forest where Lorraine began searching for some herbs. She was having trouble finding them so she started thinking that the information she had been given may have been wrong. The world was a really boring place for her at the time since she was just too good at life. She became the youngest person to ever receive the title of Great Doctor, but she didn't care about her achievement, was starting to get tired of being surrounded by adults all the time. Great doctors get the perk of being able to sign up as adventurers and start at silver rank, so for no other reason than she was bored, Lorraine decided that she would go out and become an adventurer. She finally spotted one of the plants she needed and excitedly began to harvest it. Afterwards, she calls Ren over so she can put her harvest in the bag, but then she sees that Rent beat her out by at least 10 times in plant gathering. She is about to ask him to tell her how he managed this, but Rent cuts her off because he notices something is off. There is a goblin currently staring them down, and it is about to fire an arrow. So Rent tells for Lorraine to use a fire spell to take it down before it can do any damage to them. Lorraine does as he says, and a huge fireball is launched, destroying the goblin and somehow not starting a forest fire in the process. Lorraine is shaken by the experience but tries to play it off by saying she has been in many situations like this before, although she had several people guarding her back then. That is when she realized that Rent wasn't sent with her as training, but rather because the people at the guild were worried that she wouldn't be able to handle herself if things got dangerous. However, Rent is still a new adventurer, so she wonders how he could be so knowledgeable, so Rent recounts what he was told. If you want to become a good adventurer, then you need to learn to read and write, as well as learn about plants and monsters and anything else possible. And just like that, Lorraine was rizzed up. She asks Rent if he could teach her everything he knows about adventuring from then on, and since then, she's been by Rent's side as he tries to become a mithril adventurer. Meanwhile, Ren has finalized the details of the sword he once made, so he says goodbye to the blacksmith and the receptionist. Before he goes, he has handed a replacement sword for him to use while his main one is being made. As he leaves, the blacksmith and receptionist talk to each other, and it seems they realize that the guy they were talking to had to be Ren. After all, there aren't many people who can use all three attributes and also have a close relationship with Lorraine, but he is clearly in a bit of trouble. They think he has been cursed, but don't understand why he didn't try to come to them for help and instead kept his identity a secret. The blacksmith thinks that it may not be that he doesn't trust them, but he just isn't the kind of person to cause trouble for others even if he needs help. For now though, it seems like he will keep coming to their shop, so they'll get another chance to see him again. That evening, Rent made dinner for Lorraine, but while she greatly enjoyed the meal, Rent wasn't able to enjoy it since ghouls don't get hungry at all. This brings up the topic Lorraine wanted to discuss. She spent all day calming through every book she had on his situation, but there isn't much info available. All she can tell is that Rent's case is special, which is probably why he is able to evolve in the first place. She asks what he plans to evolve into next, but he has no idea what it is going to be. All he wants is to look as human as possible so he can live like he used to. So to do that, he is going to need to head back into the labyrinth and defeat more monsters. In the labyrinth, there is a man fighting a slime and it is very clear that he has no idea what he is doing as he is about to get himself dissolved. However, Ren happened to be passing by and saved the guy from certain doom, and immediately after he starts walking off. In the labyrinth, it is an adventurer's responsibility to make sure they come back alive, so you are not obligated to help others if they are in danger. There are even some ill-intentioned individuals who would pretend to be hurt just to lure you into a trap and rob you. The man catches up to Ren and asks that he let him join him while he goes through the labyrinth. As you can probably tell by now, this guy is new to adventuring and can't take down a slime, but he's a chef in Malt and is currently drowning in debt, so he needs to find a way to pay back 15 gold by next week. 
He turned to adventuring to make some quick cash, but most parties rejected him because he was inexperienced. So he just needs Rent to give him a chance, and he promises that he will do everything within his power to make himself useful. Rent tells the man that he is busy, and besides, this dungeon has already been explored so much that your chances of finding anything valuable are incredibly low. Rent suddenly realizes that there might be a way to help this guy make the money he needs, so he decides to let him tag along and shows him the way to the new room in the dungeon where he died. The guy thinks he can make a fortune just by giving this information to the guild, but he knows Rent is the one who actually found it, so he can't take credit for it. Rent tells him that it's fine for him to take the credit since he needs the money anyway, but he wants the man to stick around with him while he keeps exploring the hidden passage. They come up on a hidden passage and Rent has the experience to know that you never trust an empty room in a labyrinth, but the man has no such sense. He steps straight into a teleportation circle and gets sent off to who knows where instantly. Now the smart thing to do would be for Rent to ditch the guy and act like he never met him, but he wouldn't be the MC if he did that, so he follows through the circle, and finds the man laid out on the floor and a giant skeleton monster staring him down. Rent looks over to the unconscious man and realizes that he needs to act fast if he wants there to be any hope of him surviving. However, as he tries to bring the skeleton down by striking at its leg, he is unable to do any damage to its bones. If spirit energy isn't able to damage it, Rent decides to use his magic energy instead, but that is ineffective as well. Looking at his situation, the exit to the room has disappeared, so he is likely currently fighting the boss. And if that is the case, then he won't be able to escape until he has defeated it. Terrible luck considering he didn't want to deal with this, but since it is an undead skeleton, he should be able to damage it if he uses divinity. He's not sure if his sword will be able to hold up against his strikes, but he uses divinity and slashes at the skeleton's leg, this time severing it completely and forcing it down to the ground. And with the skeleton grounded, Rent leaps on top of it before splitting its skull in two. After the fight is over, the man wakes up to find Rent healing him. All he remembers is being attacked by a huge skeleton and being knocked out, but doesn't look like he needs to worry about the skeleton anymore since it's laid out in pieces on the floor over there. He is amazed that Rent was able to take down a monster of that size, and when he is shown the size of the crystal that came from it, he is even more impressed. Rent offers to let him just have the mana crystal so he can pay off his debt, but under some conditions of course. The man doesn't know how he could possibly be of any use to a powerful adventurer like Rent, so he shows the man his arm and tells him that since he looks like this because a monster got to him. He can't go into the guild or regular shops without scaring the people, so he would like him to do those things for him. The man doesn't think it is fair to Rent for him to give up this valuable gem in exchange for some errands, so Rent adds another condition that he is allowed to eat for free at his restaurant when he gets it back up and running. The man breaks down in tears from the kindness Rent has shown him in both saving his life and giving him the means to get his restaurant back. Rent tells him to get up so they can leave the labyrinth, but the man doesn't know how they are meant to get out of here since there is no door present. It seems that regular people can't see it, but a magic teleportation circle is clearly visible to Rent from where he is standing. Even though he doesn't see anything there, the man trusts Rent's word and goes over to the teleportation circle, leaving Rent behind in the room. Rent would like to go on ahead in the labyrinth, but with how much has happened today, it's going to have to be another time. The man takes Rank to his restaurant where his wife, Isabella, had been anxiously awaiting his return. She was so worried he would end up dead in the dungeon, and he nearly did, but luckily Rent was there to bail him out. He tells his wife the great news that Rent offered him this huge magic gem to clear their debt, but his wife is skeptical, because there's no such thing as free money. As hard as it may be to believe, Rent was actually generous enough to help him out in his time of need, but it's not completely free as the man now has to help Rent out when he needs it. His wife worries some more that he might end up doing some dangerous stuff, but he assures her that Rent only needs him to run errands for him. He was also promised unlimited free food at the restaurant, but even that doesn't compare to value of the gem Rent has given them. They are happy to finally be able to get their life back on track, without having to sell their kidneys, but first, they both sincerely thank Rent for all he has done for them. The man introduces himself as Loris and asks for the name of his savior. So Rent introduces himself properly but asks that Loris keep his name a secret. Loris swears to never tell anyone and thanks Rent once more as he leaves, but something is not right with Rent right now. As he is walking down an alleyway, he thinks to himself that he was hoping Loris would turn out to be a criminal or something, so it wouldn't have mattered if he died in the dungeon or not. His mind is growing cloudy and he isn't able to think clearly anymore, so with Lorraine's house in sight, he walks in. Lorraine is oblivious to the shift in Rent's personality, so when he suddenly hugs her, she thinks he has finally caught on to the hints she's been dropping. If only this had happened while he still had his wiener. Unfortunately, while Rent was definitely making an advance, it wasn't the kind she would have hoped for as while well hugging her, 
Rent's mask changes form to free his mouth, and he takes a huge bite out of her neck. This is when she realizes that Rent might not be in his right mind, so she calls out to him to find out if his consciousness is still in there somewhere. Rent reacts, so she's at least reassured that he is still human, but with his current state, she is forced to use magic to blast him. Just enough to incapacitate but not kill him as she wants to hear what happened from him later. She isn't upset about what he did, but if he's going to do that, at least come into her while still sane. Rent wakes up a while later, and has a terrible headache. Lorraine is sitting across from him and asks if he still has the urge to devour her. Rent has regained his sanity, so he no longer craves Lorraine's juicy flesh. And now that that has been cleared up, she begins asking him what he remembers of the incident. Rent recognized this strange urge back with Loris when he found himself wishing Loris was someone he could kill so he could eat him. But after he turned out to be a good person, Rent came back here and Lorraine suddenly looked so delicious so he couldn't help himself. He apologizes for what he has done, and Lorraine doesn't hold it against him because she knows he didn't do it of his own volition. Lorraine had figured something like this might happen since ghouls prefer to eat the flesh of humans, but more importantly, she asks if Rent's body is okay, since she did use a lot of power to knock him out, but Rent says he is doing alright. Even if he says he is fine, Lorraine suggests that he get some rest so he can heal, and she'll do the same in the next room over. Before she goes, Rent stops her and asks to see the wound he inflicted on her. Lorraine complies with his request, so Rent uses his divinity to be in healing her wound. Lorraine is surprised by the amount of divinity Ren is able to use, but this should be enough to heal a wound like this, so by the time Ren is done, there are nothing but some faint bite marks on her shoulder. This still isn't good enough for Rent, so he pours more divinity into the wound until it completely disappears. Since the wound is fine, she can't use it as a reason Rent needs to marry her now, but now that she thinks about it, the way he looks has changed quite a lot. His body looks almost human now so he might really be able to pass this off as an injury that he got. He checks himself in the mirror and realizes that his mask changed form, so now his awful lip game is on full display. This is terrible for him since he needs to keep that hidden, but as he thinks this, the mask changes form to cover his atrocious lips but leaves his eyes uncovered. This means he is able to control the mask to some extent with his desires, but when he tries to get the mask to come off, he doesn't budge even slightly. For now, this isn't too bad since he does still look like an undead, so he would still need to keep the mask on anyway. As he changes its form to cover his mouth, Lorraine points out that he is able to speak much clearer than he could a moment ago, so he comes to the conclusion that he must have evolved again. But why did that happen now if he defeated the skeleton boss while he was still in the dungeon? Lorraine hypothesizes that it could have been because he ate her flesh, but she still isn't sure of it herself. Right now, he looks a lot like a guest, but not the floating fireball blaster kind that serves under a vampire, but there is still no explanation for why a gas was his next form. Even among the world's top academics, evolution remains a mystery, but she has got a hypothesis regarding the matter. The two sit down to talk, and Lorraine begins by saying Rent was a skeleton at first, but then he evolved into a ghoul. But the very fact that he evolved into a ghoul is strange in and of itself. If evolution was just a monster becoming a more powerful version of itself, then why didn't he go from a skeleton to a skeleton knight or something? Sure, there are cases where skeletons have turned into ghouls before, but in Rent's case, I think it is safe to infer that when evolving, you take the form of whatever monster you want to be. That is certainly plausible since Rent wanted to look more human like a vampire and he is on that tech tree now. But if that's the case, then why didn't he just go straight up to being a vampire since he really wanted to? It was probably due to him not being high enough in level to get to a vampire. There are no guarantees of returning to being a human, but it is certain that if he intends to become a vampire, then defeating powerful monsters may not be enough anymore. There are still a lot of things they don't know about the evolution, but they'll cross that bridge when they get to it. But with that out of the way, there are some experiments that Lorraine would like to try out on Rent since he is transformed, so she asks him to take off all his clothes as with him having more meat on his bones, he may have gotten his other meat back as well. She's going to look over every inch of his body and also wants some flesh samples, but she knows Rent must already be pretty tired from all that happened today, so she decides to let him rest for the day. The next day, as Lorraine is still in bed while Rent is out training, his flesh-eating impulse is gone and he feels perfectly fine, but his sword is in no shape for him to use it in a fight. He goes back to the blacksmith and the guy certainly isn't pleased with the condition of the lone sword. Rent apologizes and explains to Cloak that he ran into a giant skeleton and was forced to use divinity on the sword to defeat the monster. That explains why the sword is so damaged, but there shouldn't be any monsters in that labyrinth that require the use of divinity. So Rent then explains that he found a hidden area in the labyrinth, and Klop assumes that's why he looks like this now. In any case, Rent would like a sword so he can go explore that labyrinth hidden room again. 
So to accommodate him, Cloak gives him a better sword, but also reveals that he knows it is Rent under that mask. As Rent leaves, he can't believe he was found out by Cloak, but at least he got a new sword to use in the dungeon. This should help him get his next evolution. Later, Ren is down in Lorraine's lab and he promised to help her with her experiments, but he's starting to have second thoughts about this now that he sees the concoction she was cooking up. She had Ren drink the poison and it tasted terrible, but that was all. It has no negative side effects on him whatsoever thanks to his undead nature. Yet he is still able to use healing potions and herbs, so he definitely doesn't follow the normal rules of being undead. By this point, Lorraine has gotten really sleepy from all the experiments she has performed on Rent, which prompts her to ask if he still feels the need to sleep even when he is aghast. He answers that he barely needs any sleep at all, however, when it comes to his appetite, although he doesn't like to admit it, he has a slight desire to drink human blood. Lorraine had expected as much and offers Rent a vial containing a mystery liquid. He hesitantly takes it, but as he opens the bottle and takes a sniff, he finds that the liquid is human blood. Lorraine assures him that it is her own blood, so while he may be hesitant to consume human blood, he needs to take a little every once in a while to keep himself from losing control and attacking random people like he did last time. Ren accepts her kindness and then puts a drop of blood on his finger so he can taste the blood. And it is delicious. For now, all he needs to keep himself in check is one drop, so he will make sure this vial will last for a long time. He tells her that he will be heading out soon, so she should get some rest while he is gone. He plans to head into the labyrinth, but first, since he has a more human-looking body, he thinks he might be able to go to the guild in person this time. Lorraine can immediately tell that it is going to be a bad idea, since if he wants to take on a job there, he will have to bring out his adventurer card, and there will be an uproar if everyone finds out this is what he looks like now. He doesn't see what the big deal is since he was just a regular old bronze adventurer, but Lorraine points out that the guild really liked him. He would always help out by guiding new adventurers and taking on the jobs that no one else wanted to do. There were even meetings about bringing Ren into work for the guild. He had no idea that they valued him so much even though he's not even a high rank adventurer, but they really didn't want to hire him. They just wanted to wait for him to retire from adventuring first. Ren has no plans to ever retire from the guild, which is what Lorraine had expected, but there is still the problem of him taking on quests. If he ever wants to get to Mithril, he is going to have to prove himself to rank up. But in order to do that, he has to take the quests personally. And since he can't show up there as Rent without causing a fuss, Lorraine suggests that he go in and register as a new person. Rent takes her advice, so later that day, he walks into the guild for the first time since he dies, and he is glad to see this familiar building. He spots Sheila over at the front desk and walks over to register as a new adventurer. Sheila tells him that there is paperwork that he needs to fill out. But if he would like, she can help with that. Rent tells her it's fine since he is able to read and write by himself. The last time Rent filled out this form was over 10 years ago now. As he finishes filling out the form, Sheila is surprised to see that he put his name down as Rent Vivier. She says another adventurer who was also called Rent went missing a while ago. Rent is glad to see that she was worried about someone like him, but to throw her off his trail, he asks if she is talking about a guy called Rent Fena. Sheila asks how he could have known that, so he tells her that he is a relative of Lorraine, and she informed him of the situation. Sheila is disappointed because lately, there were rumors of a strange man going and coming from Lorraine's house. She was hoping it was the rent whom she had known, but it seems like she was mistaken. Sheila heads off into the back to finish his paperwork, and while she is gone, Rent thinks to himself that it was a good thing he said he was Lorraine's relative. He wouldn't want to have people mistakenly think she had a lover or something. Sheila returns to Rent after completing his registration, and tells him that he is now an iron-class adventurer. But she gives him a warning not to get himself killed. Rent later heads into the dungeon and this time he hears a fight happening off in the distance. The voices sound like those of some kids, so he goes to take a look and finds a swordsman and a healer fighting a goblin. They are probably new adventurers, but they seem to be working well enough together, so he decides to leave them alone. For now, he has to hurry and explore that hidden room before any of the other adventurers here find it. He returns to the teleportation circle and steps in, finding himself teleported to a creepy bedroom. He looks around a little and finds a skeleton on the bed. But this is just a regular skeleton. This means that there was someone living in this dungeon at some point, but before he can take a closer look, a woman appears from behind him and asks him to state his intentions for being here. He can already tell that she is bad news, so Rhett tries to defuse the situation by telling her that he is an adventurer and just came to search this place. However, that does nothing to calm the woman down since if he is an adventurer, 
then that means he came here looking for something to steal. She doesn't want this place to be disturbed, so she raises her hand to fire a magic blast at Rent. And although he tried to use spirit to block, it still blew him back against a wall. His shirt was destroyed in the process, revealing his gas body. The woman sees this and seems to understand what happened, so she apologized to him for the misunderstanding. The woman knows Rent must be upset right now because she just burned off his clothes and also tried to kill him. So to make up for it, she offers him her coat in exchange. Revealing that she's got barely any clothes underneath. She doesn't seem too bothered by her lack of clothing and tells Rent that her cloak is nice and more valuable than the clothes he was wearing before, so that this shouldn't be enough. Rent is just glad that she no longer wants to kill him. So he takes the cloak. The woman explains to him that this place is really special to her. So she would greatly appreciate it if Rent would be kind enough to keep this place a secret for her sake. This means she doesn't want him to report to the guild about the hidden room, but it's not like telling the guild would actually be terrible for her, since no one can enter this place unless Rent comes in with them. Since he is still an adventurer, the woman doesn't want to send him back empty-handed, so she offers him an acacia map instead. The map is a magic item that will automatically record the spaces which its owner has traveled through. With this, the woman says they are even and proceeds to teleport Rent out of the dungeon. He wakes up by the dungeon entrance and goes to see Lorraine to explain everything that just happened to him. At this point, she thinks Rent might be cursed with how many life-threatening situations he gets put in every day. In any case, after taking a look at the magic map, Lorraine can say with certainty that it is not cursed, so it is alright for Rent to use it if he wants to. He asks if she knows how to use it, but when she tries, it doesn't react to her magic at all. She asks Rent to give it a shot, so he applies his magic and the map begins to record the entirety of the labyrinth he usually goes to. This is amazing by itself, but it also shows the names and locations of people who are currently in the labyrinth. This puts this map at the level of a national treasure, and it can also show layouts of other dungeons as well, but only the paths that Rent has used. Since the map turned out to be so great, Rent asks Lorraine to take a look at the cloak he got, and after a brief look, she can confirm that it is of really high quality. The cloak has very high magic resistance imbued in it, and it is so strong that a blade wouldn't be able to pierce through it. Ren is starting to think he got a really good deal with the trade from the woman, but there is still the question of who this woman who tried to kill him truly is. He doesn't have much to go off of, but he knows that she was really strong. At least stronger than a gold-class adventurer. This intrigues Lorraine further as it means there is someone out there who has the ability to make a living space within the labyrinth. Ren says he is going to go back into the labyrinth tomorrow, but she doesn't think that is a good idea, especially since he nearly got killed today. The way Ren sees it, his going back should be fine since the woman just told him not to tell the guild about this place, not that he could never come back. As Ren enters the dungeon the next day, he thinks about what Lorraine said about him being cursed. It may be true as he accidentally found a hidden area and encountered one of the most powerful beings in the world immediately. He came undead and then got a cursed mask by accident, but he doesn't view himself as unlucky or anything. Thanks to all that happened, he has been able to fight powerful enemies and get stronger than he ever could have gotten as a human. He heads back to that hidden area, but this time the entrance has been sealed up completely. He checks his map to make sure he isn't mistaken about the location. But when he looks at the map, it no longer shows anything behind the wall. This must mean the woman doesn't want him to come back here right now. Back at the guild, people are still asking about the situation with Rent Fena, who is still missing. And they are trying to remain hopeful, but saying he may have taken on a long escort mission, but by now, is starting to look like he has gone for good. Just then, Rent appears behind her and gives her a jump scare. He wants to take on a quest and shows it to Sheila. The quest is one which involves fighting three orcs at once, so Sheila thinks it may be a bit too difficult for Rent since he just recently joined the guild. However, he assures her that he is up for the task since he is strong enough to defeat orcs by himself. Thus, Sheila entrusts him with a quest, adding that he shouldn't do anything too risky since his life should always be more important and Rent understands that better than anyone, having already lost one life. A little while later, Rent returns with the required materials after defeating three orcs, and Sheila is honestly surprised that he managed to pull it off. To prove that he actually accomplished the task, Rent takes out his magic bag and shows Sheila the three pieces of orc meat which he had acquired, and they are well preserved as well, so Sheila is sure the client will be happy with the results. Although she asks Rent to wait a moment while she goes to do something in the back. While Rent is waiting, the other adventurers in the guild are starting to murmur about him since he apparently took down three orcs by himself despite being a newbie. 
Sheila soon returns with a scroll in hand and suggests that Rent could take the promotion exam for bronze class adventurers. It is rare to offer the exam to an adventurer who literally started a day ago, but she thinks he has potential, so it shouldn't be a problem. That evening, Rent is talking to Lorraine and she is impressed that he got offered the promotion so soon after joining as a new adventurer, but it makes sense considering the level of strength he possesses right now. Mainly thanks to the undead body he has, but it still counts as his strength. By the way, she forgot to ask which name Rent chose to register with, so he informs her that he named himself Rent Vivi. Lori nearly chokes on her tea after learning that he chose her last name and asks why he would do that since everyone already knew she was close with Rent Fauna. He just didn't want people to start thinking Lorraine was having a random man stay over at her place, so he chose to have people think he's a relative of hers. And Lorraine understands his reasoning behind what he did, but she also doesn't care about her reputation as much as he thinks she does. The next day, Rent goes in for the promotion exam, but Sheila is surprised to see him here as she thought he would opt to wait for the next one so he would have time to study for it. But the next one is several months away, and he doesn't want to wait that long, so he chose to do this one. The exam begins, and they are all informed that they will be tested on the guild's rules and the proper way to handle monster drops, so only those that pass this test will be allowed to move on to the practical exam. Now that everyone is informed, the instructor tells everyone who wants to take the written exam to follow him. They are all seated in a class, and Rent realizes that there are way more people than he thought there would be. There are also some familiar faces taking the test, but while it is pretty hard for a regular person to be able to read and write, he had learned a whole lot of things while he was still in his village, so this test is going to be easy, especially since it is his second time taking it. After the test, a lot of adventurers are beating themselves up for failing, but Rent managed to get perfect score on the test, so he asks what he will be required to do for the practical exam. Sheila informs him that he will be required to form a party with a few other examinees and complete a job for the guild, so she introduces him to Laura and Rise. Rise doesn't seem to like him a whole lot, but he introduces himself as a swordsman who can use spirit to raise his physical strength. Next is Laura who introduces herself as a mage who can also use healing magic. The test is about to begin, so the instructor gets everyone's attention and informs them that they are going to be heading into the labyrinth of the new moon, and after he hands them their maps, their job will be to reach the point marked on the map. There are no restrictions in particular, and everyone is meant to head to the same spot, so this is more of a race to the finish line. The adventurers make their way to the labyrinth of the new moon, and Rise is feeling confident since he has been in this one before, although only on the first floor. Before they can rush in, Ren stops both Rise and Laura, telling them that they may need to buy a new map. The one the guild provided them with is over 15 years old, so they won't be able to trust anything that is written in it. Rent heads over to a nearby stall and asks to purchase a map, so the stall owner, thinking he's got a couple of suckers over here, tries to sell them the map for two silver coins, and even I can that's a rip-off and I don't understand the currency. Before Rise and Laura can get scammed, Rent speaks up and says a map of the first floor should only cost them five bronze pieces, Seeing as Rent is aware of the actual price, a merchant agrees to take the bronze. Now in comparing the new map to the old one, there is a world of difference between the two as the new one is far more up-to-date than the one they were given. The merchant gives the kids some advice and tells them to listen to what Rent has to say because he clearly knows his stuff. Rise agrees, but he still doesn't understand why the guild would give them outdated maps. Rent points out that the carriage that brought them here could have just as easily taken them somewhere else just because. So as an adventurer, you should never let your guard down too much, lest you fall victim to little tricks like this. The group soon makes their way into the dungeon and come across a horde of skeletons which they now have to engage in battle. Red reminds Rise to keep his guard up at all times as he goes into battle, and with the help of Laura, they defeat a lot of skeletons fairly easily. Ren is impressed with how capable they are considering their age and have their teamwork down to a science. But there's still a bit of work to be done in individual capabilities as Rise gets his sword caught by one of the skeletons and ends up needing to be saved by Ren. He is thankful for the help, but there weren't this many monsters here last time he was in the labyrinth. He is right and Ren knows what is causing it as he finds a pouch of incense on the ground. These things can easily attract monsters to an area, but Rise doesn't get why they are here. Rent gets the attention of the two and explains that there is going to be an ambush up ahead, and it's not going to be monsters this time, so they must be ready to fight humans. Around the corner, Rent gets into position to counter the sneak attack and successfully blocks a sword strike from this bald dude. There are two others coming to attack, so Rent leaves the bald guys for Rise to handle while he goes after the archer and mage. 
The archer tries to fire an arrow at him, but Ren is able to dodge and get in close to take him out. And immediately after, he deals with a mage and destroys his staff. Meanwhile, Ryze is still struggling against the swordsman who is stronger than him, so he needs Laura's help to blind him while he goes back in for round two. It looks like Rent won't need to intervene in this one and they eventually manage to take the guy down by working together. And after tying them up, they find out that these guys are taking the promotion exam as well. The instructor did say that anything was allowed, so this technically doesn't break any rules. But it loops back to Rent's initial point that anything can happen in the labyrinth, so they can never let their guards down as adventurers. They've only managed to make it this far thanks to Rent's help. So Rise swallows his pride and promises that he will follow Rent's orders from now on. They move forward and Rent tells the guy that has been watching them not to leave his friends tied up for too long. These guys were actually sent by the guild, but there should have been no way for a new adventurer to know anything about this, so the guy that was hiding is beginning to have his suspicions of Rent. Meanwhile, back at the guild, Sheila gets called in by the guild master because there have been rumors going around about Rent Vivi. Although he hasn't really done anything, the other adventurers are saying he may be a criminal with how skilled he is and no one knowing anything about his past. That isn't really grounds to take any action against him, but they can't ignore accusations like this, so he wants Sheila to keep an eye on him. Rent and the others make it to the entrance of the dungeon boss room and Ryze is pretty hesitant to go through with a boss battle, but this is the only way to reach the goal. Rent tells him there is no shame in backing out of a fight which you aren't sure you can win, but then moments later, another party approaches and starts arguing with him over wanting to go ahead first. Rent thinks this is a great opportunity, so as the other adventurers start picking a fight with them and make Laura uncomfortable, Rent points his sword at the leader of the opposing party and makes it clear he could hack them down to pieces in half a second if he wanted to. The other party leader backtracks and says he was just joking, but despite their rudeness, Rent still lets them go ahead at first. The other party thinks he is dumb for letting them go ahead, and Ryze doesn't get why he would allow them to take the first fight when they got here first, but Laura is sure that Ren has his reasons for doing so. And moments later, a scream is heard from inside the boss room, and those adventurers have to be carried out because they have been badly injured. Rent was sure they would lose the fight, but the guild had stationed employees nearby to get you to safety even if you lose, so the Ryze has nothing to fear for this battle. However, Ryze never had any intention of running away since even though he is scared, if he runs away here, then he would never be able to call himself an adventurer again. So he will continue to press on alongside Laura. And now that he has made his decision, they all enter the dungeon together to face the boss. As they enter the dungeon boss room, they come face to face with a grand slime, but Ryze is confident that they won't lose against something like this the same way those other guys did. If anything, they will be able to report that they defeated it after the other group failed to do so. Red is glad to see that they are enthusiastic about the fight, but in truth, there is no reason for them to want to defeat the monster. The rules never said you needed to be the one to clear the boss room, it just said you needed to get to the location that was past the boss room so things would have been much easier if the other group managed to kill the slime. However, this is a good lesson in the fact that life won't always give you the easiest way to achieve your goals, so you should always be ready to work for it. Rise charges at the Grand Slime while dodging the incoming attacks, but as he gets closer, the slime changes its shape for one last powerful attack. However, Ryze was already expecting this, so he jumps up and aims to strike the slime core with his sword. Unfortunately, the slime is too thick to be pierced by him, so he ends up being pushed back. Laura begins to get a spell ready to assist him while Rent watches their battle. He gives Laura some advice on gathering her mana, but he doesn't want to get directly involved because he is sure that with the abilities they possess, they should have a good chance of winning against the slime. Before they came in here, Ren informed the two of them that most physical attacks are completely ineffective against a Grand Slime, so they are going to need to use magic to finish it off. He asked Laura if she knew any powerful fire spells they could use, and she just so happened to have the perfect spell in mind, but it has a really long cast time, so she would be defenseless while she prepares it. Ren says it's fine since he will be there to handle the slime's attacks while she's casting, but Ryze interjected and asked to be the one who was tasked with handling the slime. This is why Ren is leaving it all up to him. But as he was starting to get pushed around by the slime, Laura asks him to go help Ryze since he is struggling a little. Rent jumps in to save him from getting dissolved, and with the extra assistance, Ryze is able to regain his footing, so the two of them successfully keep the slime busy and buy time for Laura to finish her spell. Once the spell is complete, she warns the others to back away as she fires the large flame arrow at the slime, creating a huge blast wave and burning it until its body liquefies from the damage. Laura is glad they managed to beat it, 
but it's not over yet as the slime would still be able to regenerate if they leave it as it is, so he tells Rise to finish it off by destroying its core. And once that is finally done, they have successfully defeated the Grand Slime. Before they start celebrating, Rent pulls out some vials and tells the others that they should take a little break to gather the slime fluids as it is worth a decent amount of money, so they decide to go along with it and spend a few minutes gathering the slime fluid. Unfortunately, while they gather the slime jizz, some other adventurers run past them to try to take the first spot and Rise is upset, because this could mean they lose the first place prize. However, Rent says it's fine they want to try and get ahead, but they won't be making it far. Moments later, his point is proven as the guys that ran past them are all knocked out by a sleeping gas trap that was set by the guild to catch them off guard. Adventurers often let their guard down when they think they are close to their goal, so this is another lesson to always remain cautious. Besides, even if those guys had made it to the finish first, it wouldn't have made much of a difference, since this was never a race to begin with. The instructor did say that they needed to make it to the goal, and the way he announced it was meant to insinuate that they needed to get there first, but he never explicitly said it was an actual race. They were being tricked from the beginning, but Rent saw through it, which is why he was in no real rush to get through the labyrinth. When it comes to being an adventurer, all that matters is completing the request within the allotted time frame, so there's never a need to rush. Rise would have appreciated being given this info a while ago, but Rent wanted them to learn to think for themselves, which is why he didn't mention it. The group exits the boss room and is greeted by a man by a desk who welcomes them as the first to successfully make it here. Rise and Laura are a lot more suspicious than they were when they first came in here, so they refuse to believe him until he shows them some identification that proves he is actually a guild worker. The man gladly provides said identification and now assure that he is actually a guild staff member, the two can relax a little. The man then presents them with three badges, saying if they take these back to the guild, then they will be promoted to bronze rank adventurers, which is great and all, but since they were the first ones to make it here, Rise wants to know what that was promised to the first adventurers to get her will be. The guild staff member then pulls out three potion bottles complete with the holder set and Rise is clearly happy to receive it. Now that they successfully passed the test, Rent asks if the two of them would be willing to take a brief detour with him before they leave the dungeon. They agree to follow him, so Rent leads them down a set of stairs that go to the second floor of the dungeon. Neither of them have ever been here before, and according to Rent, it is a place beyond the understanding of the human mind, so he wanted to show them what they would be facing now that they are bronze rank. The second floor of the dungeon leaves them in awe, as it is a whole forest biome. There is even a sun here despite them being underground, and far more strange things to be uncovered the deeper down you go. This excites both Rise and Laura, so much so that Rise wants to spend some time exploring the floor right now, but Rent says they had better head back to the guild since the test isn't officially over until they present the badges to the receptionist. Back in town, Rent and the others have managed to make it back safe and sound, although there were traps on the way back as well, so Rise and Laura are exhausted. They head back to the Adventurer's Guild and present their badges to Sheila who tells them that they have officially completed the exam, but when Rise asks if this means they can have their ranks raised, Sheila is a bit hesitant to answer because she doesn't know if they qualify yet. However, moments later, she gets handed a report from a co-worker, and they learn that there was actually a hidden process to becoming a bronze-class adventurer. The guild has had this guy following them around to see what kind of people they are and what they do in certain situations, and if it turned out that they were bad people, then the guild reserves the right to deny them their promotion. But they have nothing to worry about as the report says they are decent people. Rise wasn't really following what was said, but he heard that he and Laura passed, and that was good enough for him. He celebrates with Laura because this means they'll actually be able to earn enough money to live here together, so it was worth running away together for this even though Laura's parents didn't approve. Sheila doesn't know whether she should be happy or worried for them, but things like this happen fairly often, so she just lets them have their moment. Meanwhile, Rent just acknowledges to himself that he is back at his old rank once more. The group exits the guild and both Rise and Laura thank Rent for coming along with them because they never could have made it through the labyrinth without his help. They'll make sure they never forget the lessons he has taught them, and because of those lessons, they feel like they are finally real adventurers. Laura would like to ask him to keep adventuring with them, but she can already tell that that's going to be impossible because Rent has a different goal from their own. That is probably why he was putting so much effort into teaching them about adventuring, so they could make it on their own without him. So they hope to adventure with him again someday. Both Sheila and Rent watch as the two return home and Sheila comments on how good those kids are. While he was with them, Rent felt more like a parent than anything, but they also did a lot to make him feel welcomed, so he is grateful. Now that they are gone, Sheila turns to Rent and says she has a question to ask him. He already knows it's probably about his original identity, 
so he asks if the guild is going to punish him for creating a fake identity for himself. Because if so, he will simply never return to the guild again. He turns to walk away, but Sheila pulls him back and says she just wants to know what happened to him. That's all. He thought about running away, but Sheila was genuinely worried about him, so he decided it was worth telling her what happened to him. Once they are alone behind closed doors, he tells her that he has a problem he is dealing with right now, so what he is about to tell her must stay between them. Not even the guild can know about this because it would be really bad for him. Shilia tells him that she has no intention of telling the guild about him, partially because she doesn't know the details, but also because she wants to hear the full story from him first. She wants him to trust her, but if he can't take her word for it, she has prepared a magical contract which once signed will force a penalty on her if she reveals his secret. The penalty is if she tells anyone of Ren's secret, then she will quit her job at the guild and travel to a country where slavery is legal, where she will then make herself a slave to the most pervy man available. Rent doesn't understand why she would go so far just to get him to confide in her, but it's because she really wants to help him since it's because of him that she was able to grow up. He may not realize it, but there are tons of people who are grateful to him, so he should let her return the favor. Rent agrees to sign the contract and tell her what happened, so to begin, he shows her what his face looks like now. Sheila is shocked and from her expression, Rent thinks she must regret asking about it now. But she regrets nothing and would much rather know if he were suffering so badly. She asks what happened to make him look this way, so Ren explains that he has become an undead monster. She did not know it was even possible to become one, but Ren can see that she is distressed. So before he continues, he asks her again if she is sure she wishes to try to help him. She is unable to answer, so Ren gets up to leave. But before he does, he clarifies that he has no intention of hurting anyone even if he is an undead. But he also understands that it may be hard of her to believe him at this point. As he's about to walk out the door, Sheila calls out to him and says she believes him when he says he won't hurt anyone, because he has always been so kind to the people around him. She promises that she will help him, so if anything ever happens between the guild and him, he should tell her so she'll do her best to resolve it. Ren ends up bringing her over to Lorraine's house because she insisted on getting to speak with her, so as Lorraine opens the door and sees Sheila, she jokes that Rent must be having a fling with her. But she's here to discuss serious matters, so they all talk while they have some of Rent's delicious cooking for dinner. Lorraine praises him for all the hard work he does around the house, but all he gets in exchange for now is that vial of her blood which keeps him from getting bloodthirsty. Sheila understands the situation since Ren is currently aghast, but she warns him that he has been sticking out a little too much lately. There have been a lot of rookie adventurers going missing recently, and people are beginning to suspect Ren might have something to do with it. Most of the rumors are being spread out of jealousy though, and Ren finds it flattering that people are jealous of his skills right now. Still. He'll need to lay low for a while so people won't be able to spread rumors about him. And he may not like it, but that means no labyrinth exploration for quite a while. The next day, Ryze and Laura are back in the guild ready to take on their first quest as bronze-ranked adventurers, while Sheila and the guild master watch from above. He's happy to see the rookies working hard, but he still has his concerns about rent with all the rumors going around. Sheila assures him that he was followed while he was in the dungeon, and the report says he's a good person, so there's nothing to worry about. We later see Lorraine waking up in bed as Ren heads out for the day. He's got a naked girl in bed, but the man has his priorities straight even though he can't head into the dungeon until the heat from those kidnapping accusations die down. However, that's not going to stop him from working towards his goals. Ren heads into town to go pick up that sword he has commissioned, and it is everything he could have hoped for. Adjustments were made to suit Rent because his battle habits are well known, but this is just a way of letting him know that his real identity has been found out. It was crafted to be able to use divinity, mana, and spirit, so Rent tries it out on the practice dummies that have been laid out for him. He first imbues his sword with magic, and as he uses it, he is able to strike cleanly through the wood, which is something he never could have done before. Still, all he can do with magic is force it through the sword, but that doesn't apply to spirit as he has managed to gain a decent amount of control over how he uses it. He charges the sword up with his spirit energy and is able to pierce clean through the block of wood even leaving behind scorch marks in the path his sword took. Last up is his divinity, so he imbues the sword with its properties and manages to use it to slice the logs in half. Ren is glad the sword managed to hold up to his divinity without taking damage, but he fails to notice that his divinity made the wood start growing sprouts. He just accepts it as a byproduct of the power, but that still doesn't explain how he is even able to use something like divinity in the first place, since it is usually a power you can only get by having God bestow it upon you. Ren explains that years ago, he happened to repair an old abandoned shrine, and that good deed was apparently enough for God to bless him with divinity. At the time, Ren just did it because he felt like doing it, and even now he still doesn't know which god that was, but it must have been a low-ranked one to have taken favor on him. 
The blacksmith asks if he can keep the sprouting wood and use it to make something since it may have some divinity in it now, and Ren doesn't really mind as long as he can keep practicing here. Even though he has tested out the sword already, he still wants to try using all three powers at once. They bring out a huge block of wood for Ren's experiment, and the blacksmith asks if he knows anything about the magic spirit fusion technique. It is a combination of both magic and spirit at the same time is said to massively boost the power output. It takes your master to pull something like that off, however, there's the slight downside that if you mess it up even slightly, then your body goes boom. Ren obviously doesn't want to go boom, but at the same time, an explosion probably wouldn't be enough to kill him with his current body, so he decides to go through with it anyway. Just to minimize possible losses, he tells Ren to try it with a different sword so even if it ends up destroying it, he won't lose as much. Ren begins the process and puts magic into the sword before imbuing his other hand with spirit and backlash is already being felt as he begins to struggle. To him, it feels like he is trying to cram power into a box that is already full to the brim and he can barely hold up against the strain. He completes the slash and the force of the power blows the block of wood to ashes, but he is still going to add divinity on top of that, so the blacksmith is getting worried over what Rent is trying to do here. Rent still seems determined to try it out and does the same action again, but this time he adds divinity into the mix and it becomes incredibly unstable. The blacksmith tries to tell him to stop since the sword clearly can't take any more of this, but Ren holds out a little longer and pulls off a strike that bends the laws of physics after it hits the block. The stand-in sword turns to ash due to all the strain, but the two are left perplexed because all the strike managed to do was turn the block of wood into a ball of wood. Ren apologizes for ruining the spare sword he was given, but the blacksmith says it is fine since he expected this to happen anyway. Divinity is a power that removes all impurities from a material, so a normal sword could never hold up against it since it breaks the bonds that hold the metal together. The one he made for Rent can handle divinity, but it most certainly cannot handle the amount of power that was just used when Rent combined those three forces together. The best it can do for him would be to handle the magic and spirit fusion, but anything more would absolutely destroy it. Rent remembers the attack he took back when he was in the dungeon, and he is not sure he'll be able to hold up against something like that with just the magic spirit fusion. The blacksmith tells him he doesn't have many options for that since the only other way to use it is to have dozens of single-use swords at the ready at all times, but that would be way too expensive for him to manage to pull off. Ren is going to need a lot of good equipment if he is going to become a mithril adventurer, but to get that, he will need to make a lot of money. As he is walking through an alleyway, he hears a man pleading with an adventurer to help him out, but the adventurer tells him there's no way he can do that since he can't take on quests unless they come from the guild. The adventurer has really done nothing wrong in this situation since the guy is the one bothering him to break the guild's rules, so he was about to beat the guy up when Ren stepped in to stop him. He tells the adventurer that he'll handle the guy and teach him a lesson, so the adventurer leaves the guy to Rent. The guy thinks he is in for a thrashing when he sees Rent walking up to him, but Rent reassures him that he won't be getting his legs broken today. He can't guarantee that he will be able to help him with his request, but he will do his best to assist him. The guy asks him to help him defeat the Lord of the Lake and Rent is a little intrigued. He ends up on a carriage to the location with the guy and he thinks back to how much of a mess he has gotten himself dragged into. His name is Riantis and he is from the village of Tatsu Village. Back in Lorraine's house, he was explaining the situation and the legends surrounding the monster. The legend states that if they offer up a young and beautiful girl who possesses a bunch of mana, then the Lord of the Lake would save their village, however, it was just a story. They hold a festival once a year to remember the day, and it was meant to just be a ceremony where no one actually gets hurt, but this time, the girl that was playing the role of the sacrifice actually got eaten. And from that day on, it started actually demanding sacrifices from the people. So many of the village girls have already died from being sacrificed, and the next one up to be sacrificed is his sister, so he can't bear to let it happen. Riamtus wishes to save his sister, not to kill a monster, so there is no real reason to kill a monster if he can find another way to settle things. They arrive at the village, and it is a small, quiet one, but it used to be much more lively before the constant sacrifice of the village girls began. Now people don't have the will to even leave their homes anymore. Riamtus leads Rent to his home, and there is a mark on the front of the door. He explains that this mark is one that means the people of this home are the next that have to offer up their daughter to the Lord. Rent asks if the monster is the one that put the mark there himself, but it lives deep in the forest and no one has really ever seen it in person before. The mark was probably put there by one of the monsters Kelpie, and this catches Rent's attention because a Kelpie is actually a pretty powerful monster. The door opens and Rand's sister comes out to meet her brother. He happily greets Amiris and tells her that he has brought an adventurer from the city to save her, but she is fed up with his shenanigans and drags him inside so she can give him an earful. 
She had warned him not to go talking to any weirdos when he went to the city, and he went and brought back Rent, who looks like a serious weirdo. Riontis tries to insist that Rent is a good person, but she doesn't buy it because he is probably just trying to trick him. Next thing you know, he may end up talking about your horse's extended warranty. Sadly, Rent can hear every bit of the slander she is throwing at him since his senses have been sharpened ever since he became a monster. Amaris soon opens the door with Riontis holding his face in pain in the background. She thanks Rent for listening to her brother's foolish request. But this festival has been a tradition her village has partaken in since ancient times, so she can't selfishly ask to be the only one spared from her fate. So she asks Rent to forget about the request and go home. Rent tells her that the one who hired him was Riantis, so with all due respect, he doesn't have to listen to a word she just said. Riantis is glad Rent is going to stay and go through with the request, and since she can't stop him, she asks that Rent stay in their home while he is here. However, she doesn't want him to interfere with the festival because she is glad to become a sacrifice for it. That night, Rent meets with Riantis to talk about Amiris. He can clearly tell she is the stubborn type, so there is no way she would willingly run away from becoming a sacrifice even if they asked her to. Riantis knows what he is asking is dangerous. If there is a chance to save his sister, then he is willing to do anything it takes, no matter the cost. The next day, Rent is out for a walk to gather information and happens upon a trader in the middle of the forest. The trader is trying to persuade the children to bring their parents here with some food because his business has been suffering ever since people stopped coming out. Just then, Ren approaches him and asks if he can ask a few questions about the situation here, and the kids immediately disperse because they think he is a monster. The trader asks him if he is new in town since he hasn't seen him around here before, and Ren states that he just arrived in town. The merchant then tells him that he came at bad time since the lord of the lake is angry right now. And for that reason, the people of the village aren't willing to come out of their homes to buy his stuff. Riontis comes over to tell Rent lunch is ready, so he apologizes to the merchant for interrupting his business and begins to leave. Once he meets back up with Rantis, he asks if that merchant comes here often, and he apparently does, but Rent finds him to be a little suspicious. Evening rolls around and Amiris is being prepared to be sacrificed to the Lord of the Lake by the old ladies in the village. They apologize for doing this to her. But she says it's fine since it has to be done anyway. The old ladies were sure Rantis would take her and run away since he had been begging everyone to call off the festival. She thinks that would have been a bad idea since if they make the Lord of the Lake angry, then he may destroy the village entirely, and Riantis knows that as well, but he was still worried for his sister's safety. She sheds a tear remembering how kind her brother is, even if he is a fool. Later that night, Rent comes into Amira's room because he has something he wants to talk to her about. She tells Ren he can't come in since it is a rule that the sacrifice is not allowed to meet other people casually, so he stands at the door and says what he wanted to say. He will take care of things for her. There is always a way, but that means she has to struggle for it as well. She doesn't think they will be able to beat the Lord of the Lake since it is simply too powerful to be beaten. But Rent says he and Riemtis will find a way to pull it off, so she shouldn't do anything to make her brother sad. That was all they wanted to say, so he leaves immediately after to begin taking care of the situation. The villagers have begun the ceremony and are about to have Amaras go out in the boat to her doom. But while the villagers think she is quietly accepting her fate, she is secretly working together with Rent and Riantis to take down the monster. As they sail out into open waters, the fog begins to roll in, so Riantis thinks they should just turn back and run away, but the orb Amiris was given as part of the sacrifice begins to glow and a monster emerges from the lake. Amiris tries to offer herself to calm the monster's anger, but Rent slaps the orb out of her hand and says she is just wasting her time, because the orb is just a beacon to attract it. Rent jumps out of the boat and begins walking on water thanks to some special boots Lorraine made for him, and he begins breaking down his thought process. Krakens are monsters commonly found in oceans, not lakes, and they don't spit fire either, so as he attacks it, it is revealed to have been an illusion cast by the merchant he met earlier that day. And considering the power Rent has at his disposal right now, he is easily able to take down a bunch of weak magicians. After they are captured, they all head back to land and explain everything that happened to the villagers. The merchant was pretending to be the lord of the lake and was demanding sacrifices from them all for his selfish reasons. He had suspected something like this might have been happening since a monster that is worshipped as a lord wouldn't want to start killing its subjects out of nowhere. But that still leaves the question of what happened to the girls that were sacrificed. So Rhett threatens him to answer truthfully, if he wants to keep his kneecaps intact. The merchant confesses that he kept the girls in a hut on the other side of the lake and was going to sell them off as slaves in another land where slavery is legal. So the villagers rush to go rescue them. After the whole mess has been cleared up, Rend is set to head back to Malt, even though the village would like to host him as their savior. Before he leaves, Amiris gives him a kiss as thanks for saving her from getting sold into slavery, and she would have given him an even better reward if he stayed longer. But Rent heads back to the city that day. 
Later, he is telling Lorraine what happened as they talk over some tea, and Rent thanks her for the boots that walk in water, since those were really helpful. But Lorraine is more interested in how he got another girl to fall for him after only one mission in the town, yet he still remains oblivious to how much of a harem magnet he is. Rens is taking a look at the job postings at the guild and finds one that was put up with one bronze piece as a reward. However, with the current economy, taking a job like that is basically working for free, yet some adventurers are still likely to take on the job regardless of how poor the pay they receive may be. Some adventurers may take the job for the exposure and others do it just to help the people in need out once in a while. As he continues to look at the request board, he is noticed by Sheila who comes up to ask him if he has found a quest he is interested in. Ren starts off by saying he doesn't plan to head into the labyrinth anytime soon, just though she advised him not to. She tells him she just came over to see if he needed any help finding a quest, so since she offered, Ren asks her if no one else has taken the quest with a single bronze pieces as a reward. She takes a look at the board and the quest Ren is talking about is indeed still unclaimed, but it is going to be a difficult one. It requires him to gather a dragon bloom flower, but this particular flower is sent to only bloom near a poisonous swamp, but the story behind the flower is certainly lovely. It says the dragon once fell in love with a human, so his blood became the bright red flower as a symbol of his love. Ren has heard of the story before, and it is certainly nice, but the person who made the requests says they need it for medicinal purposes. It is someone from the orphanage, and they want to use the flower to save someone who they care deeply for, so Ren decides to take the quest after all. He later heads over to the orphanage to gather some more information from the person who put in the request, and the building looks far more run down than he had initially thought it would be. Rent doesn't want to cause any problems for the people living here, so he takes out a tube of slime fluids he had on him and uses it to repair the handle. Good enough anyway. He then proceeds to knock on the door to see if anyone is home, and as he does, a young girl comes out to answer him. She initially doesn't take a good look at him, so she assumes Rent is someone else, but once she opens her eyes, he is finally able to let her know that he is the one who took the quest she posted. She apologizes for her mistakes since she thought he was a debt collector, he is the one who took her quest then he is welcome to come inside. Once he enters, Rent finds a room full of kids, and as soon as the girl tells the others that Rent is an adventurer, they all begin to swarm him with questions. The girl tells them to knock it off because she already warned them that adventurers are dangerous people, but then she turns to Rent and apologizes because he is an adventurer as well. He doesn't take much offense to her statement since it is pretty much true for the majority of adventurers, and he even gives the kids a little warning not to get close to strange adults so recklessly in the future. He can tell that they are good kids, and the girl attributes that to the good upbringing they've been given by their headmistress Lillian. Ren introduces himself to her as a bronze adventurer, and she is quite surprised since she was sure the best she would get for a quest like hers was an iron adventurer. She introduces herself as a Lise, and Ren begins discussion regarding the quest she posted. Dragon Bloom flowers are not easy to come by, but she was already aware of this since they are hardly ever sold in stores. And even when they are, they are incredibly expensive. Way too expensive to buy on her salary of zero dollars. However, she needs one anyway and Rent is willing to help her as long as she can tell him the full story behind it. She agrees to tell him, but it has to be kept a secret for her sake. And after Rent agrees to the terms, she takes him to go see Headmistress Lillian who is currently sick in bed. She greets Rent and thanks him for offering his help, however, she seems to think he is here to help clean out the orphanage basement and Rent doesn't correct her since he promised to keep the actual request secret from her. Lillian is having a hard time talking, so Elise tells her to get some rest while she handles talking to Ren instead. In another room, she tells Ren that Lillian is a priestess who is able to use divinity, but if a user's divinity is not strong enough, then there is a terrible side effect. Each time she uses divinity, evil energy will accumulate in her body, and while it isn't bad enough to kill her anytime soon, her condition will only get worse with time. Ren had no idea a condition like this existed in the first place, which is odd especially since he can use divinity as well. But Elise goes on to say that the only possible cures for this disease are the blood of a holy maiden, or a special type of medicine. And this medicine requires the dragon bloom flower. They haven't told Lillian about the disease yet because she would likely just hand the orphanage over to another priestess and accept her fate to die, so Rank just needs to help her get the flower before that happens. Elise is really happy that Rent agreed to get the flower for her, since she knows the quest is pretty unreasonable, but Rent doesn't have an issue with it so he promises that he will definitely get that flower for her. But before he does that, he decides to clean out the basement since he is here anyway. The reason the kids can't do it is because monsters spawn down there for some reason, so he heads down with caution, not knowing what may jump out at him. Alez is following him as well since she thinks it will be fun to watch Rent hunt a monster. He doesn't see what could be so fascinating about watching him slay some monsters, 
However, for her own safety, he hands her a dagger so she can defend herself if the situation calls for it. They head further into the basement, where they finally come across some of the monsters Lillian was talking about. These are basically really big rats or your average New York sewer rat, so Rent doesn't use his sword and just strengthens himself so he can beat it. The rat lunges at Rent but he is able to fling it back with his fist. However, when the rat comes back in for another bite, Rent actually gets caught off guard and bitten. He is still able to shake off the rat though, so it's not a big deal however, something strange happens to it, as after ingesting Rent's blood, it suddenly changes color and now obeys Rent's every command for some reason. This is a big development, so Rhett returns to Lorraine's house as soon as possible so he can show her what happened. Once she sees him, she asks what's up with the rat on his shoulder. After a bit of explaining, she understands the gist of what happened to him. She has heard that vampires are able to make and control familiars, but she never would have guessed that Rent could do the same thing. Although she never really checked to see what would happen if Creature drank his blood. Rent asks if he can keep the rat and Lorraine is fine with it since she has already got an undead monster living under her roof. However, the economy is tough right now, so the rat needs to pay rent. But if it doesn't have money, then it can pay with his body. For experimental purposes, of course, she asks Rent what he plans to call it, but he isn't very creative when it comes to naming things, so she decides to come up with a name for it instead. She decides on the name Adel, since it means noble one and the rat was the leader of the other rats in that basement and Adel seems to be really pleased with his new name. Rent can't really speak the language of the rats, but he is able to understand what Adel is thinking most of the time. Later that night, Ren is looking over his equipment because he has nothing better to do. He no longer needs any sleep since he became an undead monster, so he had initially thought about just staying in the dungeon indefinitely and grinding until he became Mithril, but people would find it suspicious if an adventurer never needed to rest. A few moments later, Lorien comes into the room and offers Rent something he never thought he would get from her. A home-cooked meal. This is such a rare occasion that he doesn't know how to respond, but Loring takes offense to his surprise since she is pretty confident in her cooking skills. Changing topics, she brings up the fact that Rent is set to head into the swamp to find that flower for Elise, but he should be aware of just how dangerous that swamp really is. Rent planned to go alone since he wouldn't have to worry about poison if it were just him, but Loring points out that there are other dangers there such as the wyvern-type monsters that live there. Even bronze adventurers would be forced to create a party to tackle such a dangerous area, but Rent doesn't really plan to fight them in the first place. He's just going to use some holy water to keep them away from him until he finds what he is looking for. Rent is later seen riding on a carriage that is taking him to the swamp, and after going a certain distance, the man tells him that he won't be able to take him any further than this since it is going to get too dangerous. However, he'll be back in the evening to pick Rent up after he's done with his job here. The swamp is really difficult to traverse, however, many rare plants grow here so it is somewhat maintained to be walkable, but that's about it. One of the things that makes this place so dangerous are the monsters that show up in the wild. Unlike dungeon monsters, which are a few hours old at the time an adventurer fights them. These ones have actually lived long enough to learn how to use weapons effectively and fight in groups. The goblins have planned an ambush for Rent, but with his current abilities, he is strong enough to defeat them all in one swift motion. He continues walking through the swamp and thinks to himself that it is certainly handy that he is undead, because thanks to that, he is immune to the poison which would have already killed him by now if he were still human. It's really convenient so Rent wouldn't mind staying undead forever if he could just fix the problem with how he looks, but while he was thinking about all of this, he accidentally fell through one of the weakened planks on the bridge. And now that he is off the bridge, he gets attacked by a swamp monster, which is just terrible luck for him. He ends up defeating the monster and walks back over to the shore where his adult was just watching him the entire time. Back in town, Sheila is talking with Lorraine and compliments her on the delicious food she made earlier. Ren enjoyed it as well, but that was probably due to the blood she added to it. Sheila starts regretting the food she has just put in her mouth, but Lorraine assures her that she only did that with the portion of food she made for Rent. They get back on topic and discuss the fact that the guild already knows about the village Rent went out of his way to help. They all seem very thankful to him. But when the guild asks for the name of the adventurer who helped them, they refuse to say because Rent has asked them to keep it a secret. So the guild doesn't know it was him, but Sheila is aware of his actions however, she doesn't understand why he wouldn't want to take credit for such a good deed. Lorraine points out that he is probably just being cautious since with the rumors that were already being spread about him, if there was any mention of him in the kidnapping ring, people would find a way to make him the bad guy. Meanwhile, Ren is currently running away from the monster that is coming his way. He bought holy water to keep the wyverns away, but maybe he shouldn't have bought it from a back alley crackhead. He runs into a dead end and is now forced to fight the monster if he wishes to survive. He leaps up into the air and attacks the wyvern with a mana-infused sword strike, but that wasn't enough to deal a substantial amount of damage to it. 
Thus, Ren attempts to use both mana and spirit to defeat the monster, but as he strikes at it, he still isn't able to do any damage. He is running out of options, but just when he was about to give up, Enel comes running up to the monster and covers himself in divinity before leaping into its mouth. The monster seems to have been damaged by this and ends up spitting Enel back out. Ren is surprised to find out that Edel is able to use his abilities as his familiar, but this gave Ren the hint he needed to take down the monster. So he covers his sword in divinity and strikes once more, this time being able to behead it completely. Now that he has completed that battle, he is clear to keep going into the swamp until he comes across a whole field of the flower he is looking for. He thinks it should be fine to pick more than one since there are so many here. But as he does so, he finds himself confronted by a strange man. Rand is on guard, especially since there should be no human crazy enough to willingly head into this swamp, not to mention doing it alone, but the man points out that Rent is doing the exact same thing by being here. The man explains his presence here by showing that he has a magic item used to nullify the effects of poison on him, and he got some non-back alley holy water, so the monsters are actually being kept away from him, as well as an accurate map so he doesn't get lost. He finishes off his explanation by saying he is here on a mission to gather some dragon flowers, so if Rent doesn't mind, he would like to complete his objective. As the man walks past him, Red realizes just how crazy it was for him to come here so unprepared, but he can't help but ask what the man needs the flowers for. According to him, they are for his mistress who is currently afflicted by a certain illness, so he needs the flowers to help her condition. He would much rather be by her side and taking care of her, but someone needs to come here and gather these flowers, for which he was the only suitable candidate crazy enough to try. At least that was until he got lucky enough to meet someone like Ren here since he and his mistress were looking for someone who could occasionally make it here without dying so they can get the flowers. Ren would be happy to accept the task, so he introduces himself as a bronze rank adventurer, something which catches the man off guard since he is sure there should be no way a bronze rank is strong enough to make it here. Ren asks if he no longer wants his help because of his low rank, but the man has no doubt of Ren's ability to get the job done, despite his surprisingly low rank. So long as he can accept the terms and rewards, he would be glad to have Rent take on the quest. He introduces himself as Isaac Hart, but he will leave the identity of his mistress a secret until he has finalized the request contract with him. Rent later arrives back at town, and the driver who brought him back is impressed by how skilled he is if he was able to make it in and out of that swamp without being harmed in any way. And Rent has a little fun for once and jokes that he uses his mask to hide his identity, because he is actually a mithril rank adventurer. Back at the guild, Sheila comes out to meet Rent as he returns, but she is surprised as Rent pulls out the magic bag he had borrowed from the guild and asks for a dissection of the monster he defeated. It takes a moment, but she finally realizes that he means he defeated one of the swamp monsters, but Rent wants to keep from drawing attention, so he asks that she keep quiet about it. She understands and says she will take him to the dissection area, and as they walk we learn that there are a bunch of useful items that can be gotten from monster corpses, but although he learned the basics of it, there are still some dissections he is unable to do personally. This is why he sometimes just pays the fee, and has a professional do it instead. They walk in and meet with Dario, who Sheil informs that Ren has something special to dissect today. They are taken inside and all put on gas masks since the monster is still poisonous, so Red released the corpse from the bag. As it fills the room, Dario assesses the condition of the corpse and tells Ren that he did a pretty good job taking this thing down. There is not even a scratch in the monster's shell, even though it is usually destroyed in the process of taking down a monster like this. The strat was to hit it with projectiles to avoid the poison it emitted, and that of course leads to a lot of damage to the shell. Rent must have taken it out in a single strike, which he tries to downplay to keep himself out of the limelight, but it is still an impressive feat. Rent asks that its good condition means it will be able to fetch a good price after it is dissected, and Dario is certainly of it, so Rent lets him get to work on the dissection. As he leaves with Sheila, he is a little disappointed that he won't get the money until tomorrow since he was planning on gifting it to the orphanage to keep it running. He also apologizes to Sheila for taking up so much of her time today, but she has no complaints. More importantly, she can tell that Rent has gotten to be much stronger than he used to be, so she is sure that he is at least on par with someone of silver rank, so he shouldn't sell his ability short. Rent knows he has gotten stronger, but it doesn't seem fair to say he achieved this thanks to his skills alone. Isaac didn't look like an adventurer, but he seemed to have skills equal to that of the silver adventurer or maybe even a gold one. However, those skills were likely the product of his hard work, while Rent is just taking advantage of his undead body's growth system. He only managed to get this strong because if he accidentally died and became a monster, so although he definitely still wants to become human again, he isn't sure what he would do if being human again required him to give up all the power he has gotten. He spent 10 years as a weak and powerless loser, 
only pushing through it all with sheer effort, which led him nowhere. He now has the power to actually grow from his efforts, so without it, he may not be able to keep aiming for his goal of being Mithril. The next day, he heads back to the orphanage, and once again, he accidentally breaks their door handle. But this time, he knows exactly how to fix it and pulls out the slime tube. Just then, he meets Elise who asks what he is up to so early in the morning, to which he answers that he has completed the quest she had asked him to do. She can't believe he got it done after just one day, so she hurriedly calls him inside along with the two who can turn the flower into medicine. The two are astonished by how well Rent managed to preserve these flowers since they have never seen one in such great condition. Rent doesn't understand why that would be the case since there are definitely strong adventurers who would know how to properly take care of the flower, but it's not that they didn't know how to take care of them. It's more so that they didn't have the time to worry about the flower's safety, while they are in an environment where they could be attacked at any moment. And even if they managed to gather the flowers correctly, there was always the possibility that they would get attacked on the way back from the swamp. With that being said, the healer introduces himself as Humberto, and the herbalist is called Norman, and he is certain that with a flower in such good condition, he can definitely make the medicine to cure Lillian's disease. But he asks to be able to use whatever is left over so he can help another patient who could really use the medicine. Elise is fine with letting him have the leftovers, but since it is to help people, Ren offers to let them have the rest of the flowers he collected as well. Norman would be lying if he said he didn't want the flowers, but at the same time these things are so rare they could easily make himself a small fortune from selling them. Rent is aware of that, but he doesn't really care about the money, and sometimes, he just wants to help people sometimes, and this is one of those times. Norman is deeply grateful to him for helping save so many lives, so while they don't have anything they can really offer to repay him, they promise to come to his aid if he ever needs their help with something. Later that day, Elise finishes signing the paperwork that says Rent has completed the tasks that he was asked of, and she thanks him once more for actually helping her. She was sure no one would actually do it, so she was prepared to become an adventurer and try to get the items herself. Although, she is also aware that she wouldn't be able to achieve something like that so easily. Rent asks if she no longer wishes to be an adventurer, but it is quite the opposite, actually. She wishes to become one more than ever before after seeing Rent. She wants to become an adventurer like him, who works to help the people of the kingdom, and while she cannot repay him now, she hopes to be able to help him if he is ever in need of it. Even though she doesn't believe she could ever be of help to someone like Rent, Red responds by saying even someone like him will one day find himself in a position where he needs to ask for help. And when that day comes, he would like nothing more than for her to be there for him. Just then, Adele returns to Ren and tells him that he has convinced the rest of the rats down in the basement to protect this place so Elise and the other kids at the orphanage will not have to worry about monsters showing up anymore. He also has some advice for her if she truly wishes to become an adventurer, so he instructs her to start training early and often to get up to speed. The guild has an adventuring course that could be helpful to her, and if he has the time, then he would be willing to help her personally. She's happy to hear that, but there is still that problem that she is a broke child, so there is no way she can afford something like a training sword or the fees to be taught magic, so the chances that she will ever actually learn are pretty slim. However, Ren assures her that someone he knows who is skilled in magic has the free time to train her if she wants. It's a kind offer, but Elise can't let Ren hand her everything without getting anything in return. So in exchange, Rent says she should just think of this as a loan with no interest. When she becomes an actual adventurer and starts earning money, then she is free to come repay him for all the help he has given her. She thinks this is more fair to Rent, so she agrees to take his help as a loan, only she fully intends to pay it back with interest. Back at Lorraine's house, Rent asks if she would be willing to teach Elias, and she doesn't mind, but she is a little pissed that Rent said she told the kid she had so much free time on her hands, because that makes it look like she has nothing better to do. He apologizes, but she says it's fine as long as he learns to keep the feelings of young ladies in mind. But Rent just says, what young lady? Lorraine's pride has just taken critical damage, so she now intends to use one of her spells to do some damage to Rent, calling it a test of how immortal he truly is. Rent obviously doesn't want to get hit by a spell like that, so he unlocks levels of Shakespeare he never knew he had in him just to describe how beautiful he thinks Lorraine is and calm her down. Even Lorraine is surprised by the way Rent just spoke to her, but he was just saying exactly what he thought of her. She gets a little embarrassed and tries to make up for her outburst by offering him seconds for dinner with an extra portion of her blood. Rent is still a little confused, but Lorraine heads into the next room where we see her blushing over the compliments Rent gave her. The next day, Rent heads into the guild to get some more work done, but as soon as he arrives, he gets called over by Sheila who has something she would like to ask Rent. She first asks him if he has any connections with the Latul family, but Ren has never heard of them before. She explains that the guild received a request that was placed for him personally, and once she hands him the paper, 
he realizes that it is from Isaac. Since he seems to recognize the sender of the request, Sheila thinks he must know them somehow. But that still isn't the case, since he is sure Isaac is just a servant of the family. Ren thought he already knew almost everything that there was to know about Malt, but he has never heard of the Latul family before. Sheila hasn't heard much about them either as all she's ever been told as an employee is that the family has existed for a long time and are very important to the functioning of the city of Malt. They seem to hold great power as well since every generation of guild masters has been instructed never to disrespect the Latul family. So now that Ren has received a request from them, he can't afford to reject it if he wants to continue to live in Malt. He never really intended to reject the request, but Sheila has her worries. He may be able to handle the quest they give him, but if they were to find out that he is currently a monster, then he would almost certainly be exterminated immediately. It may be hard to keep it a secret with how suspicious his outfit makes him look, but when he met Isaac, he didn't seem to be bothered by it, so it probably won't be an issue. He should probably go meet them, so he heads out to their castle out in the woods. He arrives at the front gate and asks the guard if Isaac is in there. He answers that Isaac is inside the mansion, but to get to him, he needs to cross the maze in the middle of the courtyard. It doesn't seem like a regular maze, and Ren is right about that since it was actually made with a magic item that changes the path, so it's not going to be easy to get across. The head of the family collects magic items for fun, and this is just one of his hobbies. But to sweeten the deal for him, he has promised a magic item from the head's collection if he can manage to make it across. Ren asks if the guard happens to have any advice which could be useful to him, but he just tells him that he shouldn't rely on the sun to keep track of where he is going. Ren enters since he likes the idea of getting a magic item from doing this. He is sure he should be fine with his good sense of direction, but after a few passes through the maze, he realizes that he is hopelessly lost. Ren recalls what the gatekeeper had told him about not trying to use the sun for direction, but he should be able to keep track of where he is going by making a good mental map of where he has been. He comes across a clearing in the maze, although it doesn't look like it is the exit he was looking for. In the clearing, there is a girl sitting under a canopy having tea. She asks him if he will give up on trying to beat the maze. But Rent still insists on going a little deeper. Since that what he wants to do, the girl instructs him that he should head in that direction, but she also warns him that the maze will go on for a really long time. So he might want to take a break here and regain some strength before heading back out. Ren agrees to share a spot of tea with her. But as he sits down across the table, he starts to wonder if she may be a daughter of the Lachul family. He can tell that even the teapot she is pouring water into is a magic item, but it's still strange that she didn't bring any tea leaves when they are meant to be having tea. The girl just smiles and pours a cup of perfectly brewed tea regardless. She explains that this teapot has the property of being able to replicate any tea that has been brewed within it before and Rent is thoroughly impressed with how useful something like this is. The girl goes on to explain that there are two types of magic items. Those found in the labyrinth and those made by craftsmen to imitate the real deal. This particular magic item was found in the labyrinth 200 years ago. And its worth would probably come out to about 300 platinum coins or so. Rent is shocked by the large price tags since he has never even seen that much money in his entire lifetime. But that's not to say that all magic items are valuable since you are just as likely to find a piece of junk down in the labyrinth. Rent uncovers his face so he can take a sip of the tea the girl prepared revealing his deformed mouth. Laura takes notice of Rent's mask, and Rent says he has never had tea that was quite as delicious as this before. Laura seems to have taken an interest in his mask and asks if it happens to be a magic item of some sort, which Rent confirms to be true, although it is cursed. Laura further inquires about the circumstances he managed to acquire such a mask under, so he explains that a friend of his got it for him in the city of Malt, and it only cost him three bronze pieces too, but he leaves that part out. She cuts to the chase and asks him to sell her the mask and normally be wood, but it's still kind of stuck to his face. Plus, it does help him keep his condition secret from others, so he may want to hang into it. Laura takes the hint and apologizes for thinking he would give up a magic tool like that just for money, as she is sure he must have some kind of attachment to it. Rent finishes his tea and is about to leave to continue his dungeon exploration, however, before he leaves, Laura gives him another bit of advice and says it may be best for him not to trust the sun. The gatekeeper gave the same advice, so it must mean something if they both said it. He doesn't get why they said that though, so as he heads back out into the maze, he starts watching the sun just to see what will happen if he does so. Suddenly, the sun disappears from his field of view, and he suddenly realizes something very important. To test his theory, he picks up a rock and throws it, and moments later, the stone is teleported to another location. Well, that sucks. Rhett now thinks there is a teleportation trapper that will return him to the start as soon as he looks at the sun. And if that's the case, then he has to go through the entire maze again. 
Rhett has no choice but to start over, and after several dreadful hours of walking, Rhett was finally able to make it through the maze and arrive at the mansion. There he is greeted by Laura who is glad to see he has finally figured out the trick to the maze. She introduces herself as the head of the Latul house and congratulates him formally for succeeding. With all due respect after Rhett had to go through all that, he just wants to get his reward for taking on the maze, so he is brought inside where he is told that he can have his pick of any of the Latul family's magic tools in stock. As she is explaining what they have here, Ren inquires whether he can really have any magic tool he wants. Laura confirms this, so Ren asks to be given the maze trap that caused him so much agony. Unfortunately, that is one magic tool that she is unwilling to part with. Ren tells her he was just joking since he would never want to have something that caused him so many hours of pain. It was just a little bit of payback for making him suffer through that thing just to get here. They make their way to another room where the doors open automatically, and with a single word from her, all the lights immediately turn on. Ren is amazed by this and Laura goes in to explain that she collects magic tools just because they are magic tools. It's not like they need to have any special purpose either as she shows Ren a magic ball which can only bounce. To Ren, this is just a bunch of junk, but to Laura it's as valuable as mint condition Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Ren's attention gets caught by an airship hanging on the ceiling, so Laura explains how it works to him. You are able to make it fly through the air with your mana however, it can only be controlled by this remote. Rent tries it out, and he seems to be having a lot of fun with it. So Laura takes that to mean that he wishes to have this magic item for himself. The little boy inside Rent's heart is telling him to pick the drone, but the adult in him thinks it would be a better idea to keep looking until he finds something that is more useful. However, he soon realizes that the drone has more to it than just being a fun plaything. It also has the ability to share visuals with Rent, so he could essentially use it as a surveillance drone to scope out the labyrinth without needing to head it himself. He had thought it was just a toy, but is actually more useful than he had given it credit for. Laura is glad he finally sees the value in her magic tool collection, but she warns him that the drone is hard to fly since it consumes a large amount of mana. And as a result of Rent only having the mana capacity of someone around silver rank, he is only able to fly it around for a few minutes and not very far either. She asks if he would still like to have it regardless, but while it would certainly be immensely valuable in situations where he needs to spy on people, he wants to keep looking so he can find something better. But he'll still keep the drone on hold since it'd be a good second choice. The move on and Rent finds a painting with a picture of a monster in it. As he is taking a look, Laura urges him to try pushing the button on the frame of the picture, but he should have known better than to trust Laura because as soon as he does so, monsters begin to emerge from the painting. Rent gets spooked and immediately jumps backwards, but in his panic he accidentally activates another magic tool with his mana. The magic tool turns out to be a golem which worries even Laura as she asks Isaac where they kept the deactivation tool for the golem. Isaac starts frantically searching for the off switch, but while he was doing that, the golem was getting ready to attack. It threw a punch at Rent but Rent managed to dodge out of the way in time, and it's a good thing too, since a single punch from that thing would definitely be enough to kill him. He has no choice but to face the golem head on lest he be squished, but before engaging in combat, he asks Laura to make sure that she has no objections to him damaging the golem. It's not like she would make him pay for it. But she doesn't think this is the kind of monster that someone like Rent will be able to win a fight against. Rent already knows that and has no real intentions of winning this fight, he's just trying to buy time, so he lunges forward and slashes the golem's arm, but that's not enough to stop it. He asks how long Isaac is going to take to get the off switch, but he is still looking for it on the top shelf and it's going to take a while before he finds it. Ren has a flashback to something Lorraine had once told him about Gollum. Just like one of Du Frenchmert's innators, they all have a self-destruct switch on them in the form of the words on their forehead. Ren tries to get a good look at the Gollum so he can find the self-destruct words, but as he checks, he sees that the Gollum's forehead is blank. He then remembers something else Lorraine had said about the self-destruct thing only applying to the early series of Gollums. At some point, the makers realize it was kinda dumb to put a self-destruct switch right in front of your golem's head, so instead they made the only way to stop it be through the off switch. Ren could really use that switch right about now, but Isaac still hasn't found it. Laura seems to be enjoying a show quite a bit, even though Ren is over there fighting for his life. Ren has no other choice but to use his mana and spirit fusion technique to fight back against this thing. He would have preferred to keep his ability to use this technique a secret, but he'll die if he doesn't throw everything he's got at the golem, so he gets ready for a final clash. However, before that can happen, Laura calls out for the golem to halt, and it stops moving as she and Isaac have found the off switch. Ren is now safe, but Isaac feels the need to apologize since it wouldn't have gotten this far if he were better at keeping track of where things are. Laura interjects saying the blame should fall on her since she is the master here. Ren isn't going to hold a grudge over what happened. 
and he tells her that would Eun like to keep looking for a magic tool for himself, if she will allow it. Next, she takes him to a room full of various items. They aren't exactly magic tools, but they can be used to make different kinds of medicines and weapons, so they are worth keeping around. So many materials are present here, but what Ren is most fixated on is a vial of vampire blood just sitting there. Seeing Ren's interest, Laura explains that vampire blood is said to be able to turn humans who drink it into vampires themselves. But that's just a rumor since everyone who has ever tried has just died instead. So if he drinks it, either he dies or he becomes a vampire. Rent likes those odds, so he decides on the vampire blood, but as he returns to Lorraine's house, we see that he was also allowed to keep the drone as well. Lorraine can't believe how generous these guys were to him, and Rent starts informing her of the special abilities of the drone. It allows him to share his senses with it, so he's able to get a zoomed view of Lorraine's assets from above. The drone was totally worth it. The Latul family just wants him to go get the dragon flowers for them on a regular basis, which they will pay him for. But as a bonus, it also allowed him to keep the vampire blood. Lorraine is against taking blood from people who are essentially strangers, plus he has no real guarantee that the blood is the real deal in the first place. But even if it is real, he could possibly die from just drinking it, so she can't let him take such a big risk. She personally doesn't mind if Rent stays undead forever since she would still smash regardless. He could stay here and continue working as an adventurer until he becomes mithril like he wanted, but under no circumstances does she want to lose him. It looks like Ren has a lot of thinking to do about what decision to take next here. However, Lorraine already knows that Ren has made his decision. He has wanted to become a mithril adventurer ever since he was a kid, so there's no way he would ever pass up a chance to grow stronger. Still, that leaves some questions for Lorraine, but she chooses to keep them to herself for now. Ren notices her deep in thought, so he asks her what's bothering her. After some prying, she concedes and tells him what she was thinking about, but she makes it clear to him that he does not need to answer the question if he does not wish to do so. Ren doesn't know what she could possibly want to ask him since he is pretty sure she knows everything there is to know about him. However, she points out that there are still a lot of things he keeps in mystery, such as his motivation for wanting to become a mithril adventurer. She's a little pissed about it, so she tells him to just drink the vampire blood and turn into a vampire or a pile of goo for all she cares. Ren thinks she is being a little unnecessarily mean to him over this, but she then cuts him off and reminds him of the spoken rule among adventurers which he had told her about all those years ago. It is customary to never ask another adventurer about their past, and while she didn't think Rent would have some kind of crime boss backstory, after he told her that, it was really difficult for her to ask him directly about these kinds of things. If that's the case, Rent is happy to tell her all about it right now, but it's really not much of an interesting story to begin with. The reason largely revolves around revenge, but more so the kind where Rent wants to become the kind of person who would stop a tragedy from happening. The village he was born in was located deep in the mountains and miles away from the nearest city, so Ren's father was in charge of doing all the shopping for everyone in the village when he went to town. On Ren's fifth birthday, his father decides to take him out into the city so he could have some experience there. While riding in the carriage, he talks with a girl named Jinlin who asks what he thinks the city will look like. Since they've never been there before, she's excited to see all the new stuff she's never gotten the chance to experience before. Ren's on the other hand is pretty scared since he worries that they'll be attacked by bandits, so Jinlin calls him a wimp. She also tells him that he'll never be able to become an adventurer if he keeps acting that way, although she lowers her voice so his parents won't hear her. She then goes on to tell Ren how she wants to be able to travel the world when she grows older. There's so many amazing things to be seen, and although it may come with some amount of danger, she promises that she'll make herself stronger by then, so she will be able to defend Ren if it ever comes to that. That concludes the flashback and thinking back on it. Ren can tell that he was a real wimp back then. Lorraine is pretty shocked by the story since she had imagined Ren had the stereotypical backstory of a kid training to become the strongest Hokage or Wizard King, but he just did it because a girl called him a wimp. After that conversation he had with Jinlin, his granny gave both of them one hell of a scolding for it, but he still has fun with her. On the way back from the city, the carriage was attacked and granny was taken out instantly. Ren's dad also got deleted from the census, so Ren is the only one left standing against this giant ass wolf. It was just staring at Ren, and he stood there frozen in fear, but he was then dragged away by Jinlin who still has the sense to try to get away before they are killed as well. Neither of them wanted to leave the adults behind, but the only ones capable of fighting were already taken out, so what chance did some kids have? The two ran for a long time until they thought they must have lost the wolf, but they were wrong, the wolf took the time out of its night to go hunt down a pair of kids. They aren't even worth it in calories, but the wolf was just having fun messing with them at this point. 
The wolf slashed at the kids, and as a real friend would, Jinlin pushes Rent out of the way to save his life. And as a result, Rent falls to the ground, and Jinlin gets her back sliced open. Rent rushes over to check on her, but she already knows this is the end for her. She at least takes some solace in knowing that she was able to defend Rent like she had promised she was going to do. But now that she's gone, she has one more wish and asks Rent to get stronger so he can protect himself when she's gone. The wolf is about to finish Rent off as well, but just before it can complete the squad wipe, Rent is saved by an adventurer. The man with silver hair tells him to stand back since he will be handling the wolf now. The fight begins as the adventurer draws his sword to attack, but the wolf is pretty powerful, so it's not clear who has the upper hand yet. Rent watches on in amazement as this man goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with a monster that he couldn't hope to so much as scratch. But after a brief struggle, the man makes it clear to the wolf that this isn't a fight it's going to be able to win unharmed, so it backs off. The adventurer then walks over to Ren and asks him if he is okay, while he is currently holding the dead body of his childhood friend might I add. Ren asks him why he didn't get here sooner so at least Jimlin could have survived, and the man immediately lowers his head in apology since he had the power to save her, but didn't arrive in time. Some time passes, and the bodies of everyone who was killed in the forest have been brought back to town. Rent has begun his training arc by practicing with a sword. The adventurer finds him training outside, and Rent asks him what it takes to become an adventurer like him. Jinlin wanted to become an adventurer, so now that she's gone, he wants to fulfill her dream for her. The man understands Rent's feelings, but the age requirement for registering as an adventurer is 15. So since he is still only 5, the man tells him that he'll need to train hard in this village for the next 10 years to be ready for the day he turns 15. He needs to be able to at least hold his own in a fight, as well as not be dumb, so he should invest some time into studying magic and how to survive in the wild. Next, he's going to have to find some skilled hunters and persuade them to teach him a thing or two. The man leaves Rent with his name, Wilfried Riecker, a mithril-class adventurer. He tells Rent that he is free to come find him once he is old enough to become an adventurer. Although he doesn't know where he will be in a decade, he knows he's going to keep being an adventurer as long as he is alive. That concludes the backstory and meeting Wilfried is part of the reason he wants to become a mithril adventurer so badly. Lorian can't tell if Rent has good or bad luck since coming across mithril ranked adventurer is pretty rare, about the same as the chances of getting eaten by a dragon. Someday Rent wants to get his hands on the monster that killed Jinlin and his family so he can kill it, but that will be after he has become a mithril adventurer like Wilfried. He's scared to die, but if he gives up on trying to get stronger, then he might as well be dead. Lori knew he was going to decide to take the blood, so she offers to give him a proper burial if things end up going poorly. Ren apologizes again and opens the bottle before damning the entire thing in one gulp. After taking every last drop, Lorian asks if he is feeling any different, but there are no changes, at least for now. She thinks this must mean that the blood was actually fake, but moments later, Rent begins writhing in pain on the floor. He gets overcome and pukes on the floor while inside his head, Rent can feel his mind and body being broken apart and remade in the form of a monster. He doesn't want to become like them, not like the mindless monsters that roam the dungeons. He was losing himself in the transformation, but then Lorian calls him back to his senses by reminding him of the dream he had, and that gives him the willpower necessary to fight the monster instincts taking over his body. Meanwhile, in the city, the blacksmith is up early in the morning, hammering away to make a sword worthy of rent. His wife comes in to check on him since he is working really early today, but once she sees what he's working on, she knows he is working hard for Rent's sake. She isn't much of a fighter, so she doesn't know what changed about him, but Rent seems to have gotten a lot stronger compared to the level he was at before. He even learned some new tricks, which is why this sword needs to be strong enough to handle everything Rent is able to dish out. Over at the orphanage, Elise is practicing her adventurer skills while doing some housework, and Lillian spots her so she makes a comment about how hard Elise is training. Over at the Adventurer's Guild, Rise and Laura arrive at the Adventurer's Guild first thing in the morning, along with Rena this time, and since they are early for once, they get to have first pick of the quests that came in for the day. Sheol looks on with a sense of pride at the new batch of adventurers, so she gives them a warning to not take challenges that are beyond their ability. Back to Rent, his mind has calmed down since the last time we saw him, and he actually feels sleepy for the first time in a while. When he first became undead, it felt like his body was empty down to the bone, but with each evolution, he was able to regain his organs, skin, and the ability to feel pain. But it came with a dread that he may one day go out of control and hurt those he loves. Rent smiles because he has managed to get through this somehow, and he now wakes up to find Lorien watching over him. She is reading a book about vampires and congratulates Rent on a successful evolution. Rent looks at his hands and realizes that they are far less shriveled than they were before, so he looks just like he did when he was a human, even though he's a vampire now. 
But to know exactly what kind of vampire he became, she's going to need him to take off his clothes so she can inspect him. After taking off his clothes, Rhett notices a set of wings on his back, but once he focuses on them for a bit, he is able to shrink them down. That's really convenient since visible wings would draw a lot of attention to him, but that still doesn't answer the question of what kind of vampire he became. There's no real way for Lorraine to tell the difference since vampires are so rare, but she at least knows he is more powerful than he was before. There is one last thing she wants to check as well, so she asks Ren to take off part of his mask. This reveals the fang-like teeth in his mouth, but it's not too noticeable. Next, she asks to see the upper part of his face and she sees that his eyes have changed color to red. Vampires are known to have red eyes, so it may be a bit suspicious, but it's not like there are no humans with red eyes in existence. Ren should be able to go out in public without being found out, but before that, Lorraine looks him deep in his eyes and welcomes him home with his more human form.